This video will be going over everything you need to know about the Korean animation channel, Vivinos. All their content that has been released as of the creation of this video, that contains either the PBC, any of Vivinos' horror videos, or Alien Stage are covered here. This video itself is a compilation of all my videos covering Vivinos' content from the last year and a half or so. Yes, I've made a previous compilation that was around an hour and a half long, but since then I've released over an hour's worth of more Vivinos analysis, so I felt it was time to update it a little bit. If you like Vivino's content, or channels like hers, please like, comment and subscribe so that I know that you want more content like this. Without any further explanation and wasting any more time, let's just jump into everything you need to know about Vivino's. The YouTube recommended page is a strange thing. If you're anything like me, you will see many different things on the recommended page. Things you hadn't seen before but may come to enjoy. Things you may not understand. And things that may disturb you. The channel I'm going to be discussing is all three of these things. Vivinos is a relatively new horror channel. I, I say relatively new because the channel itself has been around since around 2015. But I can't find any record whether or not Vivinos was uploading back then, but whether or not they did is irrelevant to this video. From what I can tell, Vivinos is a Korean animation channel that usually uploads small animations for segments of songs until about four months ago. Four months ago, Vivinos started to upload horror themed music videos to their channel. Small animated music videos that are always narrative focused and always seem to go over some disturbing and dark themes and topics. As of right now, the fest of June 2021, the channel has uploaded five horror themed slash disturbing music videos. As some of the artwork in these works are quite abstract, people in the comments of these videos are seemingly always attempting to decipher the meanings behind each of the music videos. So, I'll give my interpretations on four out of the five music videos that are presently out, First of all, this goes without saying, please watch the videos on your own first. I'll put a link up now in the top right of the screen, as well as a link in the description now. That'll take you to a playlist that'll let you go watch all five of the music videos first. This video is not a replacement for the music videos done by Vivi Nose. They're an analysis. I highly suggest that you click off the video now and go watch the videos yourself first, because I feel your first viewings of these music videos will lose a lot of their punch and a lot of their effect if your first viewing of them and your first experience with them is through an analytical lens through my video. So I highly suggest go and watch them now on your own and come back, please. So go watch them, come back, so we can see if our interpretations of these music videos are the same. Okay, cool. Let's start with the oldest music video of the five, Suki Suki Daisuke. Video number one. Suki Suki Daisuke. The music for this animation was not made for the music video itself. It was a pre-existing song that Vivinos decided to make a video about. The song itself was sung by Jun Togawa, and the song was made all the way back in 1985, and this helps lend to the video's old school aesthetic. All of the horror music videos I will be discussing do this. They are in a 4x3 aspect ratio, and it seems like there's a filter on top, or it's been colour graded to make it look more retro which I like. Now, to the actual music video itself. Suki Suki Daisuke is the shortest of the five, clocking around at about a minute and 40 seconds. But in that time, it manages to present the audience with a clear and cohesive narrative. There are only three characters in the story, so for brevity's sake, I'll give them quick nicknames so it's easier to understand what I'm saying. We will call this character Senpai, because in the background of this shot, you've got signs saying we love Senpai. Naming makes sense. This girl we'll call Blonde, as she has no other big characteristics that make her stick out. And finally, we will call this girl the Yandere, for obvious reasons, as I'm about to explain. The plot of this video follows the journey of the Yandere attempting to gain love from a senpai. But, as is the case with most Yandere's in fiction, the love is unrequited. This is reinforced with lyrics such as, I'll kill you if you don't say I love you. On her journey, the Yandere discovers that Blonde is gaining more of senpai's attention causing her to get angry of course, which is something Yandere's usually tend to do. But this culminates in the Yandere finding Blonde all alone, 
proceeding to murder her, and then taking her face to wear her hair on. Revealing the person who had been singing the song during the performance parts of the video are actually the Yandere wearing her new face. And as the video proceeds, we see that the Yandere's plan was successful. She's now gained the attention of her senpai and is now the apple of her eye. The main debate I see about the interpretation of this song, whether or not the Yandere is literally taking Blonde's face or is instead merely just mimicking her mannerisms and look so that she can get senpai's attention. We know for a fact that Blonde is dead. The body beneath the bed, the body in the hallway, during the intro shot, there is constant imagery alluding to this. The only wiggle room for the audience and interpretation is whether or not the Yandere literally took Blonde's face. I choose to believe the more literal interpretation of this video. What's creepier? Interpretation number one. A crime of passion so that a random girl can get closer to her crush. Or, interpretation two. A crime of passion that involves someone grafting another's face onto their own so that they can become closer to the one they love with someone else's face. It's quite reminiscent of Batman's hush, but I digress. Whilst I prefer this interpretation, there is contradicting imagery for this. It suggested that the face stealing was more metaphorical, as we see this shot of who we can assume to be the remnants of Blonde, her body parts adorning these plates. Creepy imagery, of course, but this contradicts with the ending shot of the faceless Blonde underneath Yandere's bed during the ending shot of the video. The only thing missing is her face. She doesn't appear to be missing her ears, heart, or hands, which were previously seen on the top of the plate earlier suggesting that the face stealing is more metaphorical than literal. Though I do still prefer the more literal reading of the video as I find it to be more creepy. So I side with the more metaphorical reading of the video as there is more evidence, but I find the literal meaning cooler. Next music video. Number two, My September. This song has a much less upbeat tone Unlike the last video, whilst Daisuke was more disturbing, it had a very upbeat song accompanying it. Granted, the lyrics were much more dark, but there is a juxtaposition there. With My September, the background music is much more macabre, and this is reflected much more in the visuals. My September follows a girl after the death of someone close to her. We'll call this girl Glasses, for obvious reasons. It seems that the spirit of the person she was mourning appears to be both following and interacting with her. We'll call the spirit girl Roku for reasons I'll explain later. We then flash back to before Roku's death, in which we see Glasses seemingly having a crush which is then met by disgust and overall distaste. This is then highlighted due to the fact that shortly after this ocular exchange, a flower is left on Glasses' desk. In some countries, typically eastern ones, it is customary to leave a flower on a student's desk if they die. However, if a flower is placed on someone's desk whilst they are still alive, it means that people think that you're better off dead. It's the equivalent of saying, go kill yourself. It's implied that this simple exchange of looks between the two characters is what led to this, and as a result, Glasses grew angry and sought revenge, leading to her choking and murdering Roku. It then shows Roku's shadow that has been following Glasses since her murder, proceeding to then get her own revenge by choking and killing glasses during sex. The final shot of this video is a lowered mid shot of what we can assume to be Glasses' corpse being watched by Roku. This part of the video is what is mostly up for interpretation. Yet again, whether or not it's literal. Did Glasses kill herself from the guilt of murdering the person she wanted to be closer to? Or was it Roku's spirit gaining revenge for what she believed was an unjust death? Also, the reason I have been referring to this character as Roku is due to the fact that over the course of the video, her appearance degradates and becomes much more akin to the crooked man of all things, or the old Japanese yokai, Roku Rokubi, or Pulley Neck. The similarities between the yokai and the short are merely cosmetic, as the yokai is more of a trickster and less vengeful, but I still thought the comparison of the two was justifiable. Personally, my interpretation of the video is as such. Glasses murders Roku, out of a confused sense of revenge due to the bullying she received, the flower. Also, the flower itself isn't too detailed, so I can't really tell if the specific flower has any meaning to it. Usually, most white flowers have the meaning of purity, innocence, as well as mourning for funerals. You traditionally give white flowers for funerals. If I could find out what specific flower it was, 
there may be a deeper meaning to it. But from what I can tell, the meaning is simply, in Eastern countries, Japan, Korea, etc., white flowers signify death. In the West, their meaning is a bit more contentious, but I've been talking about this one shot for too long, so... Long story short, the flower may have a deeper meaning, if we knew the specific type of flower, but in more Eastern countries, white flowers always connote death. Due to the bullying glasses received, she sought revenge on the one she loved, causing some conflicted emotions. So when Roku's spirit shows up, she then falls in love with it, but as Roku is also now seeking revenge, Roku hangs glasses, or at least makes it look like she hung herself. My interpretation is that the spirit killed her, more so than her committing suicide, because there doesn't seem to be much guilt shown throughout the video. Number 3. Magical Girl Ruru Magical Girl Ruru is a subversion of the Majo Shoujo genre. It does so very similarly to Magical Girl Sight, which is a pretty interesting read by the way. Especially if you grew up watching stuff like Sailor Moon and things of a similar ilk. It's a good read, I would highly suggest it. But it's not as entertaining to watch. Uh, I digress. The show itself shows a girl, let's call her Blue for obvious reasons, becoming a magical girl and dealing with the strife of that as well as the strife and struggle of everyday life. When she realises that by becoming a magical girl she is literally killing all of the monsters around her to protect the people around her and then she snaps and kills all the people around her. Earlier in the shot she is seen being one-upped by a friend and is shown to be not very good at much and constantly being clumsy and making mistakes. Also again leading her to snap and causing her to kill her friends as well as everyone around her. This is literally shown through the characters literally becoming angels. We just see her kill everything around her as this cheery music plays in the background pretty much. There's only one thing up for interpretation in this video yet again. Is it real? Is she really a magical girl who's just snapped? Or is it merely all an illusion? Quite similarly to School Live, which is also a good read. There is evidence for both sides. Firstly, the evidence for the side that it's all real. We see this creature, this, this small green creature, probably the creature that gave her powers. We see this creature in scenes with both Blue and her friend. We also see Blue kill monsters and then afterwards kill her friend. Granted, the monster could also be an illusion or something else. But the ending shot of the shot suggests that it isn't an illusion, as it shows us a pile of bodies filled with both people and creatures Blue has killed. School children, as well as at least one octopus. So she may have been killing one thing besides her friends. There isn't a lot of evidence for this interpretation. There is a bit more evidence for the illusion interpretation. The most notable piece of evidence is that throughout the shot we keep getting random in between frames of blue with her eyes wide open, appearing manic throughout the duration of the shot, suggesting she is insane and perhaps that this is all an illusion. In my opinion, it seems that she is disassociated from the real world, that it is all an illusion, caused by the stress of being one-upped by her friend, as well as the stresses of her parents and teachers, etc. The main reason I prefer this interpretation is due to the fact that, for some reason, it appears that the singer from Suki Suki Daisuke becomes an angel, whilst Blue is massacring the people around her. Characters become angels, pretty obviously implying that they're dead, but for some reason, one of the people that becomes an angel is the singer slash Yandere from Daisuke. Or she at least appears to be the same character. As shown during Daisuke, Yandere had become an idol of some sort, meaning that she may have become famous as a result. Which may mean in Blue's version of Heaven, she sees an idol she was fond of. This may be a bit of a stretch, but despite that fact, I still feel like the magical girl aspect is an illusion created by the girl as she uses this figment of her imagination to justify hurting small animals and the people around her. I believe that this specific creature that she is attacking is probably a couple of stray cats or dogs, and she justifies that by defining them as monsters and then perceiving them as such. The reason I believe this is simply due to the fact that the creature, appearing to be some sort of yokai, has children around it, as well as the fact that they quickly become a massive viscera instead of fading away like ghosts and monsters traditionally do in this sort of stuff. So my interpretation, personally, is that I believe it's all an illusion. Number 4. Beloved. The final shot I'll be taking a look at is Beloved, quite aptly enough. It's a love story about two girls. The story itself starts off as a flashback from one of the girls, now an adult, sadly reflecting on her past love. The majority of the video takes the form of a heartwarming story about two girls. We'll name these two girls Trip and Partner. 
We see Trip slowly getting a crush on Partner over time, and then begins to notice that Partner is being abused. Maybe by a teacher or bullies. It's possible to be either, because there isn't evidence for either. It could be either, it could be both, but it, but it doesn't really matter which one. Then we see Partner eventually reciprocate the love and kiss Trip in the nurse's office. However, this is seemingly noticed by a passerby and is spread around the school as seen in these hidden in-between frames during this section of the video. This all culminates in Partner seemingly jumping off the roof out of pure sadness, out of being abused due to her and Trip being outed as being together. Then we flash forward back to Trip, an old woman now, crying at the thought and the memory of her love falling to her death, also possibly feeling guilt. If they never fell in love, they wouldn't have kissed and been seen, leading to the increased amount of abuse, etc, etc. The main two opposing interpretations of this one are actually still quite heavily debated in the comments of these videos. Partner committed suicide due to the increased amount of abuse because of the rumours being spread about Trip and her, or she was killed and pushed off the roof, also due to the increased amount of bullying and abuse due to her relationship being outed. Let's go over the evidence for both, as it is easy to believe either interpretation as there isn't a ridiculous amount of evidence for either side of the argument. The suicide interpretation. The largest and most blatant piece of evidence for this interpretation is during the intro of the video, where there is a disclaimer saying that the video contains depiction of suicide, as well as other things, which could still be debatable, but for this side of the argument, let's say that it's gospel, and we can count it as evidence. Besides this, the facts that we get from the video can be used to debate either side for either interpretation as evidence. We know that she was being abused before the relationship was outed, and we know that the abuse probably increased after this due to partner's face being bruised and bloody while she is falling. Granted, this could also mean she was attacked and then thrown off the roof. This very much reminds me of a Korean movie that goes over a lot of similar topics and themes, King of Pigs. I would highly suggest it. Anyway, I digress. As we don't see the abuse post outing of the relationship, we can't determine whether or not partner received the wounds on her face seen while she is falling, we can't determine how she got them or when she got them, or we can't determine whether or not they were given to her while she was on the roof or before, we can't determine when or how partner received the wounds on her face, we can't say whether or not she was beaten and got them just before she was thrown off the roof. We, and we can't determine whether or not she was given them and then wanted to commit suicide as a result of them. If you discount the disclaimer from the intro, all the evidence we see for one side can be spun in the evidence for the other, but discounting that evidence doesn't make much sense. As a result, I side with the reading of the shot that has more evidence. So my interpretation is that partner committed suicide due to the abuse and probably received the marks on her face that led to her death from an abuser, not a murderer who pushed her off. Vivinos has posted a few times on YouTube about upcoming music videos and I feel like this channel will probably grow much larger than their current audience, which is already quite large, which surprises me. Despite these impressive view counts, not more people are talking about this channel. I mean, they're getting high views and they're verified, so I'm just, I'm just shocked. I refrained from talking about Vivinos' latest video, Jordan River, as I wanted something for you to dissect and enjoy yourself. Because I know despite the fact I told you profusely to watch the music videos yourself before finishing this video, I know some of you didn't. And I wanted to give you the chance to watch something made by Vivinos for the first time yourself. There's it me dissecting it and me looking at it in an analytical way. So I'll put it in the top right now and put it in the description. Jordan River is an animated music video created by Vivinos, and as kind of a follow up to my previous video, I'm going to try and break down this music video and attempt to decipher its meaning or any possible narrative that it may have. From what I can tell, the narrative revolves around a grieving, dishevelled girl with an extended, almost monstrous neck, quite similar to the girl from My September. She is mourning the loss of a friend or partner by creating an obsessive amount of dolls to try and replace them after they have died or maybe left. This is met with repugnance from the people around her, who then proceed to throw rocks at her and kick her to the ground, taking one of the dolls she created in the image of her lost loved one and proceeding to cut its head off. This then leads into a flashback of us seeing the life of the grieving girl before the event 
that led to her loved one dying or leaving. Taking some photos, which explains the photos adorning her wall during the intro, until a bomb or tornado or some sort of disaster happens, which leads to the loved one dying or leaving. We then cut back to the Martin and Gale, coddling her doll, surrounded by bodies. The scissors that were used to cut the doll adorning the ground, pink blood covering the people who bullied her. Okay, if you watched my previous video, I imagine that you weren't surprised about the question I'm about to pose to you. Is it literal? Well, let's go over the more literal interpretation of the song Fest. When taken literally, the video shows the story of a girl mutated from a large-scale explosion or accident or something of that sort that also led to the death of a loved one. Trying to cope with her death by constantly making dolls and also murdering people who try to take them away. The bomb or tornado being literal would explain the greyer and darker colour palette of the real world. However, it wouldn't explain why the people who bully the morning girl don't seem to be as mutated or burned as the morning girl in any way. This interpretation could be correct as all interpretations could be, but I feel like some of the aspects of the video are more symbolic or metaphorical than literal. I'll go over some other interpretations that are a bit more symbolic. As with all of Vivi Nose's videos, a lot of the visuals can be pretty abstract. So take these interpretations with a pinch of salt. One of the interpretations that I could infer was that the girl that is being mourned isn't dead. More so, she left the mourning girl alone, most likely to go to university. The largest collections of photo we see adorning the wall in the intro is this collection of photos showing the girl in a graduation garb. And there's also this zooming close-up of the girl graduating, which then cuts to the doll that the morning girl is creating. The doll obviously symbolising the loved one that isn't around anymore. So a possible interpretation is that the two of them were happy until they got older and one girl decided she had to leave and go to university, which led to the morning girl becoming a recluse and making dolls to try and replace her causing her to maybe get bullied and being made fun of because of it. However, there isn't a lot of evidence for this, but there is one big piece of evidence that may contradict this. The song title itself. I got this information from a comment on the video itself, so take this info with a pinch of salt, and because for the life of me I can't find any info on the Korean meaning of the phrase Jordan River, I can only find biblical meanings, which are, from what I can tell, relatively different. But according to the comment, crossing the Jordan River is akin to passing on to the other side or dying. If this is the case, it reduces the credibility of the moving away to university interpretation. But it still doesn't mean that the video is 100% literal. If we take this comment as gospel, we can infer that the girl is definitely dead. The title is in reference to someone dying and the main focal point of the plot is this girl, so it makes sense. The thing that took that girl's life may not have been a bomb or something large scale like a tornado or something of that sort. If that were the case, I feel that there would be more debris and broken down objects and stuff during the scenes when the morning girl is outside. The, f the fences in the background are still up. They aren't falling to pieces. I feel like they would be if there was a large scale disaster such as a bomb, etc. Same with the kids who bully the morning girl. They don't have any bands and aren't mutated like the morning girl. Also, the reasoning behind the girl's mutation is also more than likely not literal. I feel it's due to the fact that she has grown both angry and sad due to the loss of her friend or partner. This is shown through her appearing to kill people who bullied her because of her coping mechanisms, those being making and holding the dolls. So overall, if we take the title's potential meaning into account, both the explosion or whatever it was is symbolic. It's portrayed to be such a large scale event due to it having such a large impact on the morning girl. And also, the girl's disfigurement in the video is due to her being emotionally distraught due to the loss of the person she cared for. Just like a lot of Vivinos' videos, they seem to be a lot more metaphorical and symbolic, more so than literal. There could be a lot more different interpretations of this video that have nothing to do with the readings I've just mentioned. My interpretation could all be incorrect. And if you feel that way, let me know. Fiance is another music video created by the animation channel Vivi Knows. The video itself goes over some darker themes and mature topics, hence the disclaimer at the beginning of the video. Unlike Vivi Knows' previous videos, however, 
It seems that there's a lot less up for interpretation here, as this music video seems to be Vivinosa's version of the story of The Little Mermaid. As this seems to be a retelling of The Little Mermaid tale, I will refer to the characters by their original names, Ariel, Ursula, and Eric. I will do so, so that this analysis is easier to understand. As always with videos in this series, watch the original video first, then come back here afterwards. This isn't a replacement for Vivi Knows' music video, it's just an analysis. So, let's take a look. The story begins with us seeing Ariel seemingly meeting Ursula as she lurks at the bottom of the ocean. We then see a flash of imagery showing us pieces of the plot from the original tale of The Little Mermaid. Eric's ship sinking into the ocean, Ariel saving him, the two of them kissing, and then culminating in the two getting married. All the while, Ursula seemingly looks on in jealousy. This then seemingly climaxes with Ursula placing a curse on Ariel, which then causes her to morph and deform into a more fish-like creature, growing scales, webbed fingers and gills as she screams in agony as her body contorts and mutates, forcing Ariel to become an ugly distortion of what she once was. The video ends with Ariel being forced into Ursula's arms as she wraps her tendrils around this husk of Ariel as they both lie at the bottom of the ocean. The plot of this video is very different when compared to the other videos in the Vivinos library, as it is a classic tale retold, but with a twist. There is seemingly very little up for interpretation on the viewer's part. One thing up for discussion, however, is the nature of the relationship between Ariel and Ursula before the curse was placed. Were they ex-lovers? Was their relationship merely platonic and not romantic, and they were only friends? But upon Ursula seeing Ariel with Eric, she snaps and grows jealous. The title of the video, Fiancé, seemingly refers to Eric and Ariel, but a possible interpretation is that maybe Ariel and Ursula were to be married, but upon Ariel saving Eric, she fell in love with him, explaining why Ursula felt such vitriol towards Ariel and would cause her such pain. There is no real evidence for this interpretation, however, it's purely conjecture, but it's fun to speculate, as the titles sometimes have a large role in the interpretation of these videos. One possible interpretation is that when the curse inflicted upon Ariel activates, she runs away out of shame due to her new form being too ugly, and then retreats to Ursula as she will accept her new form, despite the fact that Ariel feels nothing towards Ursula, as shown by the lack of emotion when the two are holding hands in the ending shot. The love is not reciprocated at all. I guess another possible interpretation could be that the video symbolises the power a toxic ex-partner can have over someone in a relationship. But I'm not really a fan of that interpretation because if that were the case, it leaves the meaning of the curse up in the air. If the story was symbolising relationship, what would the curse represent? Two people are about to get married. Then, an ex-lover of the bride appears and commits an act that causes the bride to leave the altar for the ex-lover. The act she committed is kind of up in the air if you believe this reading of the video, but it's still possible. Any interpretation can be correct. Unlike other videos in Vivinos' catalogue, it seemingly focused a lot more on visual fidelity. The VFX in this video compared to other music videos is on an entirely different level. Same with some of the transitions in Jordan River, it's genuinely beautiful. The VFX for these music videos are getting better and better and it's great to see. To see what I mean, I suggest watching this video uploaded by the director of a lot of the music videos and one of the main people behind these music videos full stop. Sun Lee. Seeing the process from storyboards to the artwork and then adding VFX on top is genuinely quite intriguing. Anyway, back to an analysis. Let's go over the facts that we do have and break down what we know in the narrative for certain. Ursula meets Ariel and grows fond of her. As a friend or lover, we don't know. Ariel saves Eric from a shipwreck. Ariel and Eric fall in love. Ariel and Eric are to be wed. Ursula grows jealous of the two and places a curse on Ariel. Ariel suffers from the curse and begins to transform at her wedding. Ariel is forced back into the sea as a result of the curse. As she grows gills, it's likely that she is forced to go back in the ocean and can no longer breathe on land, making Ursula's curse even more crueler than simply transforming Ariel, forcing her to leave land for good. But it's still possible that she fled simply due to her feeling ugly and shameful. It's up for interpretation. After being forced into the ocean, Ariel is entangled by Ursula. The video ends with Ursula's hand being wrapped around Ariel's, whilst Ariel doesn't even try to reciprocate, making it obvious that even now, after all this, 
the love is still very much unrequited between the two, and it's purely one-sided. In conclusion, this video combines two elements that shouldn't really work together. The tale of the little mermaid and the trope of the jealous lover. It mixes two aspects perfectly with some beautiful artwork and VFX. That shows how this channel has improved since they started making these videos and it's great to see. So overall, this is another Vivinos video that will make it a little bit harder to sleep at night. In how many hours? 10 hours. It already comes out in 10 hours? So I've got plenty of fucking time to make a video. Holy fuck! Well, like, I got major Little Mermaid vibes, so I think it's just Gay gonna... couple. Yeah, I think it's gonna be a literal... I think it's just gonna be like a retelling of the Little Mermaid, but one of them fucking dies. Tilly Tilly Bomb is another disturbing music video created by the Korean animation channel Vivi Knows, a channel that I have covered extensively in the past. This video is quite unlike Vivi Knows's previous videos however, instead of covering two lovers who have been ripped apart by a cruel fate or something similar, this tale is simply about two lab rats. The song used in this video is an old Russian lullaby of the same name, Tilly Tilly Bomb. Not an old pop song like Suki Suki Daisuki or a somber toned ambient song like My September. No, it's a lullaby. A creepy lullaby. A lullaby so old that people aren't even sure when it was made or who even made it. Anyway, let's take a look at the video itself and try to make sense of what's on screen. The video starts off with an extreme close up on a lab rat's eye as it looks outside of its cage. The shot then pulls out to show us the full contents of this cage. Two rats, one albino rat and one brown rat. We then get another extreme close-up of a character's eye. As the shot pulls out, we see that the eye belongs to an albino girl, meaning that the albino rat more than likely represents her. For argument's sake, let's refer to her as red, since her most focused on feature is her eyes. The scene continues, as we see red getting her head shaved by some faceless scientists, as a drip is connected to her neck. As time passes and the shot pulls further out, her head becomes fully shaved and we see a person next to her keeled over and covered in their own blood. More than likely dead. The character is also dressed in the same attire and is also recently shaven, meaning that this person was also more than likely a lab rat. As this shot fades, the screen is suddenly filled with renaissance paintings that have been covered in filters and black veins painted on top of them, as well as seemingly real images that have had filters and effects put on top of them. We then suddenly cut to an image of a cross, surrounded by a white light. We then see two children, now in their church vestments, with one of the scientists presenting them to the masses as the church cross looms above them. We then see a scientist prep a syringe with what appears to be holy water from a holy water font, as the two girls hold each other's hands in fear. We are then met with more biblical imagery, but this time of Jesus Christ. We then see the two girls sitting above the praying masses below the holy cross. The two are then paraded through the meadows by carriage. The other girl, for simplicity's sake, let's call her brunette, is greeting and thanking the people, as Red passively ignores them. By this point, Brunette gets a halo around her head, very similar to a lot of the old depictions of Jesus Christ, with light exuding from their head. We see a staircase that fades into the sky and leads to the Holy Cross. We then see this shot of the two, Brunette surrounded by light and Red looking apathetic. Brunette's face then fills the shot until we get a shot of nails being driven through her wrists, then being interlaced with shots of needles being put into her wrists, as well as needles being put into her neck as she writhes in agony. We are then met with more biblical imagery until we get this shot of Brunette in centre frame, bloodied and slumped over. Then, we immediately cut to an image of Jesus during the crucifixion. We then cut back to the rat cage. We see the brown rat, collapsed on its side, dead as the albino rat simply stares at the camera. The final shot reveals that this entire ordeal was simply for some facial products. So let's break this video down. In the video's description, Vivino says that this video was inspired by the movie Midsummer. but the only thing that is really taken from Midsummer is some of the themes of religion and cultism, but beyond that, not much is carried over. Besides, maybe the use of flowers before a sacrifice and stuff like that. In my opinion, the video seems a lot less literal than it may appear. In my opinion, Vivinos anthropomorphizes these characters so that we can sympathise with these animals more. 
being used as test subjects and eventually sacrificed for our commercial use. I think this because of the introductory shot as well as the second to last shot. The story of these two characters starts and ends with rats in a cage. The rats mirroring the two kids we see quite clearly. They are shown to us as children because if they were simply shown to us as rats being injected with syringes, the effect wouldn't be anywhere near as visceral and unsettling if it was simply some rodents. Yes, it would be unpleasant to watch that, but the effect would be severely weakened. Further evidence of this is the fact that the kids get shaved. When rats get tested on for cosmetic testing, rats have products rubbed onto their bare shaved skin so it's easy to see adverse effects. Some people may argue the exact opposite, however, saying that the rats are meant to represent the children more so literally than metaphorically, that these children are literally lab rats in some shady beauty company's laboratory. And the main reason for the lab rat imagery is to tell the audience that these children are test subjects. I disagree with this sentiment because it is clearly portrayed to the audience that these characters are being experimented on. If you remove the scenes with the literal lab rats, we could already tell that these kids are test subjects. Also, thematically, the narrative is a lot more poignant if the story reflects the real world. More than 100 million test rats are still being used as test subjects annually in the US alone. So I doubt that Vivinos meant to tell the story literally, that children are being tested on, because that would turn the story of a twisted but bitterly true representation of the real world into a story about children in a top secret facility being tested on, which really dampens the effect of the narrative in my opinion. My interpretation of the video is as such. The two lab rats are represented by the two characters, Red and Brunette. We are shown how the rats are treated through them being shaved as well as injected with strange chemicals. I feel that the religious imagery, more so the imagery of Jesus Christ, is supposed to liken the act of martyrdom, sacrificing your life and dying for your beliefs, to the act of animal testing for cosmetic products. The brown rat slash brunette is very clearly meant to represent the lamb, aka Jesus Christ, being sacrificed. I believe this because of the way she is presented, with a halo and light surrounding her, as well as the shots of stigmata and the shot of the crucifixion just before her death further support this. This video compares the most famous sacrifice in all of history, the life of the Lamb, Jesus Christ, a story that we all know and are familiar with, Jesus dying for our sins, the crucifixion. This video compares that to the life of lab rats being sacrificed for something as mundane as beauty products. This video paints lab rats as unsung martyrs for the average person's convenience. It's quite ironic and poetic in some ways, and because of this, conceptually, this is my favourite Vivinos video. So overall, this video portrays a narrative about the struggle of lab rats that are constantly being subjected to heinous testing through the anthropomorphization of these lab rats, by representing them as children to make the story even more heartbreaking. Reflecting the real world in a twisted, but unfortunately, accurate way. Minako's Room is a short horror video uploaded by the Korean animation channel Vivinos, a channel that I have become quite familiar with the video is about Minako, a young girl, her friend, Gyaruko, and her new pooch, Pochi. I'll quickly break down the video, then go over what I think the video's narrative slash my interpretation is about, as well as some of the video's secrets and easter eggs. The story follows what seems to be Minako's blog posts or her own 90s style website, aptly called Minako's Room point of view of the video seems to be from a phone screen, as the video is in a 720 by 1280 resolution. The phone goes through Minako's diary entries, showing us her past posts. We see a photo with her and her friend, Gyaruko. Gyaruko is dressed in leopard print clothing, keep that in mind for later. We then see a picture of some ice cream, followed by a picture of Minako's new friend, Pochi, a nice looking Shiba. The next picture shows us Minako seemingly wearing Gyaruko's clothes. The leopard print from earlier. The picture titled My Favourite Claws, but there seems to be something in the background. Suddenly, over a month later, Minako makes an entry saying, 
I am so sad that Pochi passed away today, my poor Pochi. Showing a picture of a small mound with a cross next to it. The next post is quite a tonal shift as it returns to the more cutesy style of entries, talking about how she wants to eat a parfait. The next post, however, is quite unsettling. Does anyone know when the meat rots if I put it in the ground? This post make it seem more like an online blog than a simple diary entry, as she seems to be asking someone, perhaps their followers, a question. The next post is five days later, and only three words long. Can't fall asleep. The next post is just three dashes, looking like an ellipsis, suggesting that she's gone quiet. The screen then glitches to show us a block of text that repeats and repeats itself constantly, with some names being interchanged. Minako will pig out. It's all Minako. It's all Minako. Minako will bite. The phrase repeats itself on a loop, but with Pochi being interchanged with Minako at random intervals. We then get a flash of some cute eyes, as well as some pink legs dangling from the top of the screen, which quickly turns into more sinister blank eyes, and the legs grow darker as well. The screen then suddenly glitches with random letters and numbers, which sometimes have the previous phrases hidden in them. It's all Minako. Pochi will pig out, Pochi will pig out, etc. An error message then appears on screen, filled with a single word, Pochi. Another message shortly appears after, but this error message is a lot more important than it looks, but I'll discuss it later. Error messages then fill the screen with nothing but question marks. Three images are then shown to us. These images are more sinister versions of the posts from earlier. The first image shows us the image of Minako and Gyaruko from earlier, but Gyaruko's face has become much more eerie. Her eyes have become black voids, and her face has become featureless and nightmarish. The next image is of our humble little pup Pochi, but this time a bloody severed arm is held in his jaws. The next image is the My Favourite Clothes post, but now the image seems to be uh, in a slightly different position, so we can see slightly off camera. We see a bloody wall as well as someone seemingly slumped over next to said wall. Since the image is a low resolution and on top of that the colours have been altered, it's kind of hard to make out for definite but it very much seems like a corpse. We are then met with static as we see Minako hiding in the darkness until we hear a light switch and she disappears. The light switch flicks again, forcing Minako right in our face as she wears a blank unblinking stare. The camera then glitches and forces Minako even closer to our faces as a distorted nursery rhyme like Chime plays in the background, whilst incoherent whispering can be heard. The video then cuts to black and ends. So, what just happened? In my opinion, the narrative follows a girl, Minako, who murders her friend, Yaruko, as well as her dog, Pochi, after Pochi finds Yaruko's body and manages to snag a piece of her corpse. We know that it's more than likely that Minako killed Garako, given the fact that we see Garako wearing leopard print in the only photo we see of her, and later on we see Minako wearing those same leopard print clothes whilst a body is seemingly behind her. On top of that, we have the distorted version of the photo of Minako and Garako together, where Garako's face is morphed like this. On an unrelated note, this image unsettled me a lot more than it should. And I think it's because it reminded me of this old easter egg from Sonic CD of all things, in the sound test menu. Anyway, I, that always really creeped me out, but I digress. I tried to take a look at the whispers I heard at the end of the video, but I couldn't make them out. I, I couldn't tell what they were saying. And I also couldn't recognise the small tune that plays at the end either. So if you can recognise that, please feel free to let me know. The video is very different to every other Vivinos video. Unlike Vivinos' other videos, there seems to be a lot less up for interpretation here. But as a result, there is a lot more hidden inside this video. So let's talk about what this video is hidden. And trust me, there's a little bit of a rabbit hole here. I won't lie, upon initially viewing this video, I wasn't going to make an explained video about it. But... When it released, I decided to take a look at Vivinos' Twitter to see if they had said anything about their upcoming music video. But, upon going through Vivinos' Twitter feed, I saw this. Thank you, Twitter user at Wunkolo for spotting this. Not gonna lie, if it weren't for you noticing this, I probably wouldn't have made this video. 
Wukolo had discovered that some of the random code that appeared on screen wasn't random, it was in fact a base 64 encoded message. And when decoded from base 64 into normal characters, you get this, an Instagram link. Initially, it looks like he's cracked the code, but no, not yet. The link is dead, it, it doesn't exist. Vivinos replied it to Wunkolo's tweet saying that you should try it in a variety of ways. Then, Wunkolo came through again and realised that if you remove the underscore in the link, it takes you to this Instagram page. B-W-L-U-Q-W-T-W. -W -W. Right now, this page is pretty vacant. It follows no one, is tagged by no one, and has only a single post. The post itself doesn't tell us anything. It's seemingly Minako holding up what seems to be a wallet or something with a photo of her and Garako, but I have a theory. The way that the link to this Instagram page was discovered felt very much like an ARG or an alternate reality game. And once I realised that, it, it got me thinking a bit. I believe that this Instagram page will post more at some point in the future. I think that it will post more when either the Instagram profile gets a certain amount of followers, or the YouTube video, Minako's Room, gets enough views. I don't have anything to support this, but I, I, I have a bit of a feeling, a bit of a hunch, because I've seen some ARGs work like this in the past. I'll leave a link to the Instagram profile in the description, so feel free to follow and keep an eye on it if you want. I'll also leave a link to Wunkolo's Twitter in the description as well, because that dude was on the ball. He was trying to solve this little puzzle as soon as the video released, so hats off to him. Once I thought of this video more so like an ARG than a Vivinos video, I decided to try and go through the video to see if I could notice anything. Change the brightness to see if there was some hidden text, freeze framing on everything I could see to see if anything hidden. But so far I've got zilch. I tried taking a look at the error messages that constantly change, but I couldn't gleam anything from them. Maybe there are other secrets hidden inside the video, but I couldn't find any. But maybe you can. Also, real quick, I couldn't find a place to fit this in the script, but Garuko gets her name from the Japanese term Gyaru, which is like a fashion trend in Japan of like having bleached hair and fake tan. I thought that was just like a cool little thing. In conclusion, this video is quite simple on the surface, following the narrative of a girl who murders her friend and her dog, and keeps a serial killer like manifesto about it on her phone. But if you look a little bit deeper, it hides hidden codes that require you to decode them and look away from the video itself. In my opinion, I feel like this video may lead to a larger ARG or something similar in the future. But right now, the Instagram page acts like a neat little tie into this creepy video. So overall, I like the direction that Vivinos is taking this channel right now, and I'm really looking forward to see their next project. Pink Bitch Club is an animated music video created by the channel Vivinos, a channel that I have become <laughs> quite knowledgeable on in the past few months. This music video is a sequel to their previous music video, Minako's Room. If you haven't seen it, I suggest watching that first so you have more context for this video. I have also made an analysis of said Minako's Room, so if it confused you like it did me on my first watch, please feel free to check it out. I'll put it in the top right now. All of Vivinos' music videos so far have been very self-contained, narrative-wise. Each video has its own story, and there isn't really any overlap between them. Characters don't reappear in Vivinos' videos, usually because they meet a truly cruel end, so this music video marks the first time that a character has been recurring, or at least not as a background character like in Magical Girl Ruru, where the idol from Suki Suki Daisuke makes an appearance. Technically speaking, three characters actually reappear. Minako, Garako, and Pochi reappear from the previous video, Minako's Room. On top of that, this video also has its own music and isn't using pre-existing songs as a base for the video. Just looking at the credits for this video shows how much the production value and manpower has increased since Vivinos started these videos. Anyway, let's actually start talking about this music video itself, including introducing the characters and trying to break down the video's meaning. Pink Bitch Club starts with Minako giving the viewer a narration, stating that she has started a new club with her three friends, a club aptly enough named The Pink Bitch Club, as well as asking the audience to please keep supporting them. 
which to me makes me think that these characters are going to be recurring for a while, that the next couple Vivi Knows music videos will be centered around this group of characters. Minako is seemingly the group of this four, as she has the, her own video about her, the previously mentioned Minako's room. On top of that, she is seen alone in her room in the dark and has the most screen time, so it's safe to say she's the de facto leader and also the main character. Garako, seemingly Minako's best friend, is another character who appeared in Minako's room. Granted, she was looking a lot different in that video, given the fact that she became a corpse, but here she seems to meet a similar fate. Charlotte, a gothic Lolita, she's one of the two new characters who were introduced in this video, and she very much reminds me of Rachel Alucard from Blasblue, actually. And the final person in the Pink Bitch Club is VYT24, I think, a robotic maid. She is also shown to be a schoolgirl as well. Not much to say about her until her final scene. As the video proceeds, we see the group hanging out, going to karaoke, until all of Minako's friends disappear. She's left alone in a void without her friends. We cut to Minako, alone in her bedroom in the fetal position. Everything void of the pastel colours which were just filling the screen. The silhouettes of Minako's friends then loom over her from behind. You then see the items flash on screen that represent each of the characters. Garako's clothes, Charlotte's plush bunny, and the robotic maid's heart, as well as Pochi appearing and transforming into a magical girl. We then see Minako's drab and realistic world get changed by Pochi flying past and changing her world back into a bright, colourful world from earlier. Minako then dresses up in ways to imitate her friends. She dresses as a robotic maid, then in clothes covered in Garako's leopard print and having her hair tied back, just like Garako, and finally, as an eye-patched gothic Lolita like Charlotte. Then the screen transitions to a cluster of random imagery and glitching. During this glitch sequence, we see Garako's clothes, Minako running, Pochi float on screen, a gun from the intro being fired, as well as Minako appearing as if she is choking. We can tell that it's Minako due to one simple thing, her earrings. Out of all of her friends, Minako is the only one who wears earrings. So from this shot, we can defer that the person on the ground who is also wearing earrings must be Minako and not any other character. Since the shot is completely pink, filled with pixelated hearts and glitches, it is kind of hard to make it out. Is she getting choked? Is she having a fit? It's kind of hard to tell, but from what I can tell, I think she's being choked or choking on something because I think something is holding her neck. But as I said, it's very hard to tell. We're then shown corpses of all of Minako's friends, Garako in the bath covered in blood, Charlotte on the ground next to her torn up plush, and finally the robot maid suffering the most brutal death, having her heart ripped out, which was foreshadowed earlier in the video when it was shown in the screen with the images that represent each character. The video ends with Minako holding a finger up to her mouth to shush the camera as the line, a girl's secret is a secret forever, is said. The credits play as the videos fade out. So. What happened? There are two major interpretations I can see for this video that people will debate about. Minako killed all of her friends and is trying to bring them back to life by dressing as them. Or, Minako imagined all of her friends and is actually just on her own, alone in her room, having a mental breakdown, imagining these characters, imagining her friends. So, the major deviation between these two interpretations is whether or not the viewer believes her friends were real or a figment of her imagination. So let's take a look at the evidence for both. And then at the end, I'll give you my opinion and let you decide what your interpretation is. So, first, let's take a look at the video's lyrics. Since the song is seemingly an original song, created for the purposes of this video, which means, unlike the majority of the past videos which used pre-existing songs, we can really look into the lyrics to find a meaning. From what I can gather from the translated lyrics, the song is about keeping secrets. Hence the intro line, a girl's secret is a secret forever. This line also acts as the outro line too, meaning that its wording is more than likely very important. In the entire song, however, I believe that the most important line to the video's narrative is this. When the video quickly flashes to a seemingly unkempt Minako, alone in a darkened room, we hear this line. The moment I meet you in the fog that can't be lifted, I can change. Even if we're apart, I can find you. To me, I see this specific line as meaning she meets her friends when the fog comes over her, a delusion, and she can change herself so that she can find her friends whenever she wants, meaning that she dresses up as her friends and changes herself to become said friends so that they will never be apart. 
Also, the intro and outro line, a gal's secret is a secret forever, may mean Minako is hiding something, right? Given the context of the video's ending and the song on a whole, that secret could be a few things, and there isn't any concrete proof of what the secret definitely is. Her secret could be that she killed her friends, it could be that she is secretly mentally unstable, it could be that her friends aren't real, it could be that Pochi is dead, it, it could really be, be anything. Now, let's take a look at Minako's previous ventures on the Vivino's channel to see if there are any more clues. In the video Minako's room, we see Minako kill Gyaruko and take her clothes, quite similar to what happens in Pink Bitch Club actually. Minako wearing clothes to be more like Gyaruko. We see Minako kill Gyaruko and wear her clothes, so how the hell did Gyaruko die twice? Maybe Minako killed the real Gyaruko and made a dream version of her to cope with killing her. Or maybe Gyaruko was never real to begin with and she purely exists just for Minako to kill over and over again. Another piece of evidence is that the portion of Pink Bitch Club that takes place in the bright colour version of the world is very tropey. Okay, let me explain. So we start the video with Minako being a stereotypical shoujo protagonist, running to school in a school uniform with a piece of toast in her mouth, narrating her story, telling the audience about herself. We see her being late for school and oversleeping, being woken up. She then goes to karaoke with her friends. It's all very cliche and is incredibly similar to a stereotypical shoujo or girl slice of life anime or manga. It's quite blatant. It makes the actions in the more colourful world feel a lot less likely to be real as they are so cliche and almost dreamlike. Another small detail that could be evidence for a theory is the doll that Charlotte has. When Charlotte is introduced we see the bunny in full view. Two red eyes, big ears and a big cross on its forehead. Then later when we see Charlotte's corpse we see the bunny's face has been ripped in a very peculiar angle, ripping off both its ears and one of its eyes. And just before seeing this, we see Minako dressed similarly to Charlotte, with a similar plush to the one that was ripped, but fixed, replacing the bunny ears with a black teddy bear head, making it seem that Minako yet again killed someone and stole their clothes and appearance, just like in Minako's room. As I was going through the video again, I came up with another possible theory, which is a bit out there. As I said earlier, towards the end of the video, we see Minako and she appears to be choking on the floor on her back mouth open and eyes rolling back. Since we can't see her pupils when she's on the ground, it's safe to say she's probably dying. If that's the case, it's possible that Minako is dying and the images we are seeing during this video are her last breaths as she is dying on the ground, imagining a better life where she isn't alone and is surrounded by friends and has a robotic maid. I don't know whether or not I believe this interpretation however, as it feels like Vivinos has a lot more planned for these characters. I have no evidence that Vivinos will use these characters in the future, but I have a hunch that these characters will be quite prevalent in the future on Vivinos' channel. Also, the Instagram profile I mentioned in the Minako's Room video made a post on Instagram when this video was released. When translated, the writing says, Very cute. The last one is a secret. I'm unsure what to make of this to be honest. The image shows Minako shushing the camera just like the outro of the Pink Bitch Club video. In my opinion, I think that Minako is dreaming up her friends, the robot maid and Charlotte at least, but as Gyaruko was the only other character that has shown up in a Vivino's video before this one, I think that she was probably real. And now, in this video, Minako has dreamed Gyaruko back to life and some other friends to help keep her company. There are a lot of possible interpretations for this video, however, I feel that over time, more videos will be released about these characters and when more information about Minako and her little gang is presented to the viewers, I feel like I'll have a more concrete interpretation. But right now, I feel that Minako's friends are a figment of her imagination and she is all alone. This video is yet again a new direction for Vivinos' channel. As I've said a couple times, I think that more videos involving the Pink Bitch Club will be released and when they do, I'll be very interested to see what happens. Onigiri Dance is the latest video uploaded by the always intriguing Korean animation YouTube channel, Vivinos. The video itself is quite short, only coming around to about 30 seconds-ish, and as a result of that, it doesn't really give us anything new, law-wise, about the Pink Bitch Club members. 
Actually, if you look at the behind the scenes for the video on Q Meng's channel, the person who acts as the animation director and does a lot of work on Vivinos' videos, if you look at the behind the scenes on their channel, you can see that there was even a couple shots at the end of the video that were cut. And according to Q Meng, in the comment section of the behind the scenes video, the ending shots with each of the characters was cut because they believed that the version with just the dancing was better for TikTok and YouTube shorts, which makes sense. As I said earlier, there isn't much to talk about in regards to the Onigiri dance video itself. It shows each member of the Pink Bitch Club dancing to the song, aptly enough titled Onigiri, or Rice Ball, making the video's title, Onigiri Dance, make a lot of sense. The song itself was made specifically for the video and produced by the producer Ko.yo. Uh, check out their SoundCloud by the way, they have some intriguing stuff. The video is simple, showing us each member of the Pink Bitch Club, Minako, Gyaruko, Charlotte and VYT24, dancing to the aforementioned song Onigiri Dance. For the first 15 seconds or so of the video, we see each member dancing to the song while dressed in Angela clothing. The song in the back suiting the dance in the video as they are both, as of this point, quite light-hearted and the music is also quite high-pitched and sung very softly. After the first round of dancing, the screen glitches along with a slight distortion in the music as the voice deepens. We get another round of each girl in the Pink Bitch Club dancing in this order. Minako, Garako, Charlotte and VYT. This is the same order that is used during the character introductions in Pink Bitch Club, which is a nice little callback. Anyway, at the end of the second round of the characters dancing to the song, at around the 15 to 16 second mark of the video, there is a complete tonal shift. When I say this, I mean both thematically and visually, as well as the song itself in the background, which gets a much more deeper tone. The characters themselves go from angelic to demonic, even sporting black and red eyes. Also, text was in the background of this video, saying the group's name, The Pink Bitch Club. When the video goes through its demonic transformation, even the font changes for the group, and on top of that, the visual effects in the background of the video change. In the first half of the video, the effects were pink, sparkly love hearts. But, when the video shifts, the background changes into pentagrams and satanic symbols. Some of the characters themselves even spot demonic imagery on their clothing as well. Minako herself wearing a pentagram on her neck. Jericho and Charlotte are also spotting reverse crucifixes, which aren't actually satanic, but in recent years, they've been associated with satanic imagery, so we can still class it as such. And then after the fourth round of every character dancing, at around the 31, 32 second mark, the video then just suddenly ends. To be honest, I don't feel as if there is a lot of content here up for discussion or anything to really sink my teeth into, unlike Vivinos' other music videos. This makes sense as this video was made for YouTube Shorts and TikTok. However, there is a little bit for me to delve into in regards to the Pink Bitch Club as a whole. Since my last Vivinos video, another Instagram account has been made. An account was previously made for Minako, and the new account, however, has been made for Gyaruko. The profile itself has the name QWLUYL. So far, this account doesn't really have anything on it. It's all stuff that we've seen before. All images that have even been posted on Vivinos' community page are on Minako's Instagram page. However, something that I failed to mention in my last Vivinos video is that Vivinos posted a link to Minako's Instagram profile on her YouTube community page, and as a result, people have been tagging the profile in some cool fan art, which is kinda cool. Also, on the topic of fan art and stuff of the such for Vivinos, someone made a full Higarashi version of the Onigiri dance video, which is kinda cool. I mean, anyway, let's back onto the Pink Bitch Club and Onigiri dance. Vivinos posts a lot of things to their community page on YouTube. They post artwork of each member of the Pink Bitch Club, designed by Q Meng, cool pieces of artwork for older videos like The Beloved, and most recently, as of this video, they posted Charlotte from the Pink Bitch Club 
in the Yunogasa Yandere pose. The pose has become somewhat synonymous with the Yandere character archetype. And just for people who don't know, for a bit of quick clarification, Yandere means lovesick in Japanese and usually refers to someone who is crazily in love with someone to the point that they are willing to kill for them, to put it lightly. And as a result, I don't know what to make of this artwork due to the pose. Maybe it's just cool artwork showing off one of their original characters, or it's foreshadowing for a potential new video, showing off one of Charlotte's character traits. Who knows right now? It's all pretty much conjecture at this point. In all fairness, I personally see this video just as a small music video for this idol group. There isn't really much to pick up on here. As I said earlier, it's pretty bare bones law-wise. I feel like this video may be setting up as something much bigger. As I've stated in previous videos, I still feel like this animated idol group will somehow end up evolving into an ARG or something similar, given how new Instagram accounts are being made with seemingly randomised usernames, as well as the consistent uploads from Vivinos that are being centred around the Pink Bitch Club. I feel as if there is still a lot more in store for these four characters. Gyaru Talk is an animation released by the Korean animation channel Vivinos. This video is the first time we really get a good listen to Minako's and Gyaruko's voice. Granted, we heard Minako's voice during the intro of Pink Bitch Club, but her voice is more prolific and important here in Gyaru Talk as it ties in heavily to the video's narrative. The video is only focused on two of the four members of the Pink Bitch Club. I mean, five if you count Pochi. The narrative of this video seemingly revolves around Minako, the de facto leader of the Pink Bitch Club, as well as Garako, arguably the other most important member of the club besides Minako. Also, please bear in mind that the translation I'm using for the dialogue said in this video is from the comment section of the Garak Talk video, as I don't know Japanese or Korean, so take the translations with a pinch of salt, and if there are any mistranslations, please feel free to let me know in the comments, and without further ado, let's actually discuss the video at hand. The video itself starts off quite cutesy, with some slow paced music in the background, filled with light pinks and dark blues, which have been somewhat synonymous with the Pink Bitch Club colour palette at this point. Minako looks at the camera, puts in her coloured contacts, adds some blush to her cheeks and applies some lipstick. I also noticed that during this section, we can see what appears to be a pair of eyes in the top right of the screen. For some reason, the iconography of eyes is quite prevalent throughout the entirety of the Pink Bitch Club videos. In the video itself titled Pink Bitch Club, during the glitch sequence, we see a two pairs of eyes. And in Chino Squee, we have all the green eyes of the taxidermied animals in the fire. I feel at some point, the reasoning for the use of eyeballs will be revealed, but as of now, I'm quite unsure of their meaning. On top of this, the coloured contacts that Minako puts in are a brownish orange, which is a colour very similar to Yariko's eyes. Keep that in mind. All the while, she's saying dialogue throughout her makeup routine, until she smiles at the camera and we see Yariko. Whilst Minako was on scene during the first interval, she said the following lines. This is super cute. Damn, I'm starving. It's fine, just once. We're friends, aren't we? After those lines are said, we are then shown Garako going through a similar routine, putting on some makeup. She puts on mascara, files her nails, and combs her hair. All the while, just like Minako, she's saying lines of dialogue. The dialogue said is as such. Wanna come over to my house? That's gross. No way, it's too troublesome. We're friends, aren't we? Another notable thing about when Garako is on screen is the little thematic images surrounding her. We have her animal print acting as a border around her, which has been used to represent her since her first appearance in Minako's room. We have a light blue padlock, which I am unsure of the meaning of, as well as a butterfly in the top left, which is of the same light blue as the padlock. The screen then glitches and shows us Garako again, however this time, the screen resembles the glitch sequences from Minako's room in Pink Bitch Club. Garako's eyes are covered in static, his dialogue is still being said. However, 
said dialogue is distorted and hard to make out. Throughout this glitch sequence, we see multiple shots of Garako in different positions. One of her looking fearfully at the camera, the next has the screen almost completely pixelated as Garako's pupils are missing. That shot is then repeated as a shining love heart begins to appear around Garako's face, and the final shot that is flashed at the viewer during this glitch sequence is very reminiscent of Doki Doki Literature Club of all things. We see the shot of Garako with her eyes covered in stack again, however this time a set of four realistic eyes appear over the static bar. The eyes themselves are bright green, which again reminded me of the taxidermied animals from Chino Squee. This is kind of unrelated, but the eyes also remind me of Hajime no Ippo. It's a bit unrelated, but anyway. The dialogue that is supposedly said during this sequence goes as follows. If I'm being honest, this relationship is getting a little tiring. Why don't we hang out less from now on? Yet again, as I said, take these translations with a pinch of salt. The video then returns to Yariko without the glitch effects and distorted dialogue. We see her gesture, emote and look towards the camera numerous times. And the final shot of her we see is a shot of her afraid that we saw during the glitch sequence. However, this time it isn't covered in any visual effects. The dialogue said during this Garako sequence apparently goes as follows. This is super cute. Oh damn, I'm starving. It's fine just once. We're friends, aren't we? We then cut back to Minako, putting in her earrings and then emoting towards the camera, pulling faces and saying lines of dialogue. This is what she says during this sequence. Wanna come over to my house? That's gross. No way, it's too troublesome. We're friends, aren't we? If you were paying attention, you would have noticed that the dialogue during the final Minako sequence, uh, all the dialogue that Minako says mimics what Gyarako said earlier in the video. Both what she says and the tone it's said in is mimicked. The first three lines she says are taken from Gyarako's first sequence, whilst the last line Minako says, we're friends aren't we, is taken from the final line of Gyarako's second sequence. After that line is repeated by Minako, the video ends as the music distorts and fades as we cut to black. We get a small plug for a pink bitch club merch that's on the way, and then the video ends. So, what actually happened in this video? As this video is one of the few times we actually get voices for members of the pink bitch club, I feel that it's pretty obvious that the aspect of the video that has the most importance in regard to the narrative is the dialogue. Yes, the visuals in all Vivino's videos will always play some part in the video's plot, but as this is one of the few times we hear voices, I feel it's the most important part of the video to focus on. In my opinion, like my opinion with most Vivino's videos, I feel that there are two major ways you can interpret Yaru talk. The first major interpretation is that this video shows us the process of Minako attempting to replace Garako, attempting to take her role. She mimics Garako's lines of dialogue in both the words she says as well as the way she delivers them. Or it's possible that Minako has gotten everything she wants from Garako now, that she can copy her way of speaking. This is reinforced by the line that is said during the glitch sequence. If I'm being honest, this relationship is getting a bit tiring. Why don't we hang out less from now on? Garako has outgrown her usefulness. This may tie into two things. Why Garako is scared in this video, as well as the fate that Garako met during the end of Minako's room. Garako is afraid of Minako because she is no longer useful to her, and she is now being replaced by her. As seen in Minako's room, after presumably killing Garako, Minako wears her animal print claws. This would explain why Garako is seemingly terrified in this video, as well as explain why Minako wore her clothing. She can now mimic Garako and has now replaced her. It is also possible to use this video as evidence that Garako is the only member of the Pink Bitch Club besides Minako that is real as it is speculated that both Charlotte and VYT are merely part of Minako's imagination. So, long story short, you can interpret this video as showing more of Minako's process of stealing someone's personality and overall appearance, and after she's done with them, killing them so she can take their place. This would also explain the segment in Pink Bitch Club, in which we see Minako dressed in similar styles to every other member of the Pink Bitch Club. Another possible interpretation, which is a bit more out there and lacks a significant amount of evidence is that Minako is Gyarako. I don't believe this interpretation but it's fun to speculate. As seen during this first sequence with Minako, we see her put coloured contacts in. 
the contacts are the same colour as Jericho, seemingly. And, as we can see here, she has an extensive knowledge with makeup, as seen in this video. And this video also shows us that Minako can almost impersonate Jericho's voice perfectly, meaning that it's possible that Jericho is simply a personality of Minako. As I said, it's a bit more out there, but it's still kind of cool to think about. So, in my opinion, Garato shows us Minako trying to impersonate her friend after she has outgrown her usefulness, mimicking the way she talks as well as her facial expressions. If you disagree with this interpretation, please feel free to let me know how you feel in the comments below. One final thing. Since my last video on them, the Pink Bitch Club has went through one major change. VYT's design. It's had an overhaul. She has had her earpieces changed to a jeweled headband with a microphone attached, and her hair colour has been changed from a bright green to a more pastel purple. This is seemingly as a result of one of the images I discussed in one of my previous videos, in which BYT is polishing a picture of Multi from the franchise to Heart. It seems that that image caused some confusion, and some people who were unaware of the franchise to Heart got a bit confused and had a bit of an outcry, and as a result, that Vivinos felt the need to distinguish the two characters apart more. In my opinion, I think it was unnecessary. I prefer the old design much more with the green hair and earpieces. So overall, I feel like the change was unneeded. But if Vivino's deemed it necessary, fair enough. Falling Full Moon, or Chino Squee, is yet another animated music video created by the Korean animation channel Vivinos. It is somewhat of a return to form for Vivinos, as their previous two videos haven't been their standard cryptic music videos with darker themes. The video itself, however, focuses on one of the members of the Pink Bitch Club, Charlotte. It's even in the Pink Bitch Club playlist, and not the Caution Sign playlist, meaning that the video's narrative will focus on the story of the Pink Bitch Club, and will tie into the other videos in said playlist. Similarly, with the other Pink Bitch videos, the music used in this video was produced for the sole purpose of Vivinos' videos. As a result, I feel that the lyrics in this song have some importance to the video's narrative. Unlike some of Vivinos' other videos, as the words said in the song were created specifically for the purpose of this song. Anyway, let's dig into the actual video and try to break it down and make some sense of it. The video itself begins almost like a play. The curtains are drawn as the line, once upon a time, is said, making this feel almost fantastical and story-like. We see a girl, alone, surrounded by roses in front of a cage as a blood-red moon hangs over her. The motifs of the red moon and roses are prevalent throughout this video, and I believe that roses are meant to represent Charlotte. Even if we go back to Onigiri Dance, we can see that Charlotte has roses in her hair further increasing the likelihood that roses are intrinsically linked to Charlotte's iconography. Anyway, back to Chi. The lyrics of the song describe the person underneath the red moon, most likely Charlotte, as a pure white angel without wings. Her name was... and then the song cuts off. Then we see the girl smile as the video continues. A flower garden, seemingly filled with red roses, rushes past the screen as the sky is leaking a deep blue. The colours then suddenly shift as the lyrics come in, as well as a shot of a girl's feet appearing on the right side of the screen. The blood red moon fills the screen as a crucifix suddenly rises from the bottom of the screen. Throughout this video there are some hidden messages, but for some reason Vivinos decided to make these said messages appear in younger, fothic runes, which makes them very difficult to translate. I'm just going with what someone in the comment section of this video translated them as, as I myself couldn't translate them. This first message apparently says, the goddess came down here. Whilst the crucifix is moving to the centre of the screen, the lyrics, the Elysium garden abandoned even by the gods, are spoken. The Elysium fields were a piece of Greek mythology. It was a place that only those who were favoured by the gods were sent to after death. In layman's terms, the, it was the Greek version of heaven. The video continues as a pair of eyes overlay the blood red moon and slowly open as we cut to black. We see Charlotte walking, dressed as a nun, habit and all, as her goddess appears next to her, 
until we are met with a girl's smile as she covers her face. This is the only shot where we can see Charlotte dressed as a nun without her eye patch. We then see her in a pose until the camera gets a close up of her face as she begins to sing along to her own song. We then see a version of Charlotte from before she lost slash damaged her eye as the line drink my passionate love is apparently sung. A silhouette of Charlotte then appears with a red outline. The girl was saved by ripping off her wings. The next shot we see is what I believe to be the most important shot in the entire video. We see three people in a church. A woman, a man and a young girl. More than likely, Charlotte is the young girl we see. We see them in what appears to be a church, and the stained glass behind the family appears to be telling the story of their lives. We see the aforementioned man and woman falling in love. For the sake of brevity, let's call the woman mother and the man father. And let's assume that the woman beneath the glass is mother. We see mother and father fall in love. We see them have a child together. The third pane of glass seems to be a church building. We can tell from the crucifix pyres at the top of the glass. But what's below the church is difficult to make out. I personally see a rose or an eyeball. As I said, it's quite difficult to tell. If you can make out what it, what's below the church, please let me know in the comments. The fourth pane of glass is seemingly Charlotte before she lost her eye. We can tell that from the fact that she has the same long fringe. And since we see a small girl directly underneath the glass, it's safe to presume that this is Charlotte displayed here. The next glass pane reinforces this. We see the same girl who we presumed to be Charlotte praising a holy figure, someone wearing a veil with a halo above them. The little girl is running at what appears to be her father, but just past father we see one final glass pane, one showing the holy figure handing Charlotte a blade. Then we see a still of mother, until after a few seconds the animation takes an unusual spike in quality and gets ridiculously smooth for a second. And we see Mother whip the cylinder of a revolver into place and then proceed to shoot someone off screen. We do see a splash of blood, meaning someone was probably shot. The next shots after this help prove the theory that Charlotte is the small girl in the stained glass story, as we see her praising a figure just as the girl in the glass panes did. And we also see Charlotte toy with the figure's blade, further highlighting the connection between the glass panes narrative and Charlotte. All the while, the lyrics are saying lines such as The resurrected, picaresque pain is proof that she is alive. Just for clarification, the term picaresque has two meanings. Basically, it comes from the Spanish term picaresca, which comes from the word picaro, which means rogue or rascal. Or the term picaresque itself could be in reference to something being an episodic adventure with a rogue protagonist. For example, the story of Don Quixote. Anyway, the next shot helps tie the theme of religion into the video as we see what appears to be Noah's Ark in flames. We see animals of all shapes and sizes, and a good few of them in pairs, just like in the story of Noah's Ark. A lot of the animals also having green eyes, somewhat reminiscent of Pink Bitch Club when a pair of green eyes flash on screen. We then see Charlotte in front of the burning building with a blade in hand. We flash between two versions of Charlotte, one with an eye patch dressed as a nun, the other, while she still has both her eyes, fully dressed in white. We then see a shot of Charlotte praying with a rosary in hand as the background is pure red. The video ends as Minako appears at the church, drenched from the rain with Pochi at her side. Charlotte is weak on the floor. A crucifix from earlier flips into a reverse crucifix, more than likely symbolising a loss of faith or a change in belief system. A single feather then proceeds to fall into a black abyss and the credits roll. So. What the hell did all that mean? In my opinion, there are two major interpretations of this video and the meaning behind it. The first interpretation, the video shows us Charlotte growing up in a church after being told by her God to kill her family. Maybe to prove her faith or something or other, the reasoning isn't too relevant. She then gets shot by her mother, loses her eye, and then she proceeds to kill her family and burns down the church. After this, Charlotte is injured after the scuffle with her mother and is saved by Minako. If you believe this interpretation, you believe that most things in the video are in a chronological order. I, however, don't believe this is the order of events. Interpretation number two. This video goes over Charlotte's origin story. Just like with the last interpretation, mother and father fall in love, have Charlotte. She grows up in a church. She falls in love with a religious figure. The figure asks her to kill her family. Mother shoots out Charlotte's eye at some point, 
and around this time, Charlotte meets Minako. We know this for two reasons. One is the fact that Charlotte is still in the church. We can tell this from the pews in the background as well as the crucifixes on the door. So how could Charlotte still be in a church after she already burnt it down? So this shot must take place before the church was burnt down. We can also tell this took place at this point because of how Charlotte is dressed. When meeting Minako, Charlotte is dressed in all white. However, we can only see her left eye in this shot. Her right eye is the damaged eyeball, so this could mean, at this point, Charlotte was shot in the eye and had already lost her eye at this point, and Minako proceeded to save her. As a result of Minako saving Charlotte, it caused Charlotte to praise Minako as a god. And then after Charlotte being saved, the two of them burned down the church, maybe at the behest of Minako. Also, because all the shots of Charlotte praising her religious figure are after she's shot in the eye, it's possible that Minako was always the figure that was praised by Charlotte. Perhaps the goddess that convinced Charlotte to attack her family in the first place was simply Minako, and Charlotte didn't switch from one god asking her to kill her family to another. In my opinion, I think that this video is about Charlotte's childhood, up to the point we see her in Pink Bitch Club and Onigiri dance. We see her grow up with a loving family, probably a religious family. Then, upon meeting Minako, she then reveres Minako as a god and falls in love with her. When we see Charlotte in Onigiri dance, a wedding ring suddenly materialises on Charlotte's finger after the song has a tone change, so maybe Charlotte made some sort of commitment to Minako. Who knows? Minako seemingly saves Charlotte when they first meet. It seems that Charlotte is possibly injured in this shot. She is collapsed and on the floor of a church with bags under her eye. Well, at least under the eye we can see. It's possible that the other eye is completely shot out at this point. So overall, the video is about Minako causing Charlotte to change from a purely Christian belief system, as implied by the crucifix at the beginning and the end of the video, to a belief system centered all around Minako. Hence the changing to a reverse crucifix upon meeting Minako. Maybe Minako convinced Charlotte to kill her family to prove her loyalty. Creating a Christian parallel to the tale of the Binding of Isaac in which a man is forced to kill his son to prove his loyalty to God. I see a couple of similarities to that story in this video, but anyway, I digress. However, it is very much possible that both of these interpretations are incorrect, such is the nature of Vivinos' work. Her work leads her watchers to speculate and attempt to interpret her videos. So for now, let's just try and work together and figure out what they mean. Also, since my last Vivinos upload, a lot has happened. Gyaru Talk was released. I will have a video analysing Gyaru Talk out at the beginning of the year, if not earlier. I was swamped with university work, so I didn't have much of a chance, so look forward to that. On top of that, Vivinos released a personality test to determine which member of the Pink Bitch Club you are. Maybe there is something hidden in this small questionnaire, but as of right now, all I can tell you is that I am a VYT. Cool. Also, the Instagram page that was made for me, Nako, has been silent for a while. But the community page on YouTube and Vivinos' own Instagram have been quite active. Most funny of which is a picture recently of VYT cleaning a photo of Multi from the series Two Heart, which VYT is based on, with the caption, I always keep my grandmother's picture clean. I just thought this picture was pretty funny. The Instagram also posted these pictures of all the members flipping their middle fingers. Also quite funny. It's nice to see the characters not being torn apart and seeing Vivinos have fun with their OCs instead of torturing them. Also, personally I feel that there is no connection between this video and Tilly Tilly Bomb. The aspects of religion in Tilly Tilly Bomb are more so metaphorical and less literal, yet the use of religion in Chino Squee is completely different. Tilly Tilly Bomb is, in my interpretation, about the sacrifice of animals' lives for the sake of our convenience. Vivinos even said as much about Tilly Tilly Bomb when she said it was about experimental mouse in a community post before the video was released. Tilly Tilly Bomb uses religious imagery and stigmata to present the concept of animal cruelty to the audience, whilst in Chino Squee, religion is more so ingrained into a character's backstory instead of a symbolic meaning. So no, before anyone comments it, I do not think this video has a connection to Tilly Tilly Bomb. In closing, the music video Chino Squee, in my opinion, is about the origins of Charlotte from the Pink Bitch Club, and since the last video was focused more so on Gyaruko and Minako, hopefully we'll see a video focusing on VYT next, or if not that, maybe something else focusing on the Pink Bitch Club, as it seems that Vivinos' channel seems to focus on them now purely more than anything else. 
so I don't think we are going to get any of the classic Vivino's horror music videos for a while. Psychedelic is yet another animation created by the Korean animation channel Vivinos. Psychedelic also falls into the same category as Jaru Talk and Onigiri Dance, as all three of them make use of a thinner aspect ratio. The video is seemingly an intriguing little snippet into the Pink Bitch Club's lore. It also shows us some new designs for the club, which look pretty cool in my opinion. Also, before anyone asks, the Instagram page for Minako is still remaining quiet. Well, it is at the time of me writing this script. Anyway, let's discuss the video at hand and try to understand what we are shown on screen. The video starts with a black screen as the music begins to come in. I would personally describe this music as industrial electronic, I think, but that's unimportant. What is important, however, is the fact that the music in the background was not produced by the person who's made all the other Pink Bitch Club music so far. It was not made by Ko.Yo. They made the music for Chino Squee and Onigiri Dance, as well as some other Pink Bitch Club music. In this video, the music was produced by a Korean artist known as Sung Yeon Kang, I think. Uh, sorry for the mispronunciation. Personally, I believe it's due to the fact that the music in this video is very different to the other music made for Vivinos' channel. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back to the video itself. As the song doesn't have any lyrics, we don't need to discuss them so all of the video's narrative comes from its visuals. After the song fades in, we get flashes of each of the four members of the Pink Bitch Club. As they are surrounded by darkness, it only gives us a small glimpse of their new designs. Minako, then Gyariko, Charlotte, and finally VYT, the same order as the original Pink Bitch Club video. As the song starts to build up more, we get a panning shot of all of their feet in a line as their shadows dangle in front of them. We then get the new designs flashed in front of us in a sporadic fashion, not allowing us to see all of the design, as they flash on screen too fast and are obscured by visual effects, and the colours are changed as well, so overall the shot just looks like a cluster of colours and characters that is very difficult to make out. We then get a shot of Minako, all alone, with her shadow hitting the projection behind her. The projection is showing us Minako dressed up in the same style as every other member of the Pink Bitch Club. This shot was used in the video aptly titled, Pink Bitch Club. Just before we see the glitched sequence, we see this shot of Minako dressed as every other member. Anyway, back to Psychedelic. We are then met with a black void, filled with nothing but a pair of eyes. They're pink, and they suddenly open, revealing to us that these are Minako's eyes, showing off the character's new outfit. Minako's outfit is the outfit that changed the least from her previous one, in my opinion. She still has the pinks and blues of her previous designs, and also maintains the love heart motif she had in the Gyarotok video from when she put on her earrings. Gyaroko's eyes then appear on screen, the colour of the outline of her eyes being yellow. When they open, we see a huge design change from the previous Gyaroko. Before this design, she was dressed more like a rebellious schoolgirl going through a Gyaru phase, but now she looks more like a Japanese Yankee, a member of a biker gang or something similar. No more animal print to be spotted, she looks like a very different character here. The next set of eyes we see are that of Charlotte, unlike the previous two who had their eyes in darkness and then brought into the colour of their choice, Minako from pink eyes to a pink background, and Gyariko from yellow eyes into a yellow background, Charlotte's background starts off with white with a red eye and eye patch, which then transitions into a red eye with a white eye patch and black background. When the character's new designs are shown off, they get their chosen colour behind them, Minako with pink and Gyariko with yellow. The colour behind Charlotte is black, probably meaning that's her chosen colour. Her design has also changed quite significantly. The full gothic Lolita look has been really toned down. Charlotte is dressed quite modestly, with a long top and long skirt. She still, however, has some design flourishes of the older design. The white straps coming off the skirt and all the hair pieces, etc. Also, in Charlotte's background, we seemingly get feathers falling from the sky. This helps maintain the iconography and narrative of Charlotte, which heavily involves religion. The final character to get shown is, of course, VYT, but before we even see her eyes, we see a red jewel appear on screen. The red jewel seemingly matches what's all over VYT's new outfit. She now has red jewels on her hands, head, and chest, and seemingly now has red eyes also. 
When the red jewel fades, we get to see VYT's eyes in a black background. Her colour of choice is seemingly a nice, light, blue, turquoise colour. This video is also the first video to feature VYT since the design changed from green hair to a more purple pastel hair due to a little controversy surrounding VYT's original design. The outfit shown here is also quite strange. However, despite that fact, besides the green hair, it follows the same colour palette as her usual maid outfit. Light blues, dark blues with red accents. The red accents with the new outfit comes from the red jewels, which may be important in the future when we get a video about VYT. Also, if we flash back to Pink Bitch Club, we can see that VYT's heart, that Minako seemingly ripped out, contained a red jewel. So it's fair to say that the imagery of the red jewel is important. The shots of everyone's eyes are very reminiscent of the shot of the moon from Chino Squee. Just to be safe, I tried lining up the pairs of eyes of the four members from the Pink Bitch Club and the pair of eyes from Chino Squee. From what I could tell, none of the eyes matched or fit the profile. The next shot was shown after BYT is really intriguing. Throughout Pink Bitch Club, it's very arguable that out of the three members besides Minako, Yariko is the second most important, and these shots help further that narrative. We get mirrored shots of the two smiling, but when Yariko is shown, we see her with inverted colours for a frame. We then see the two far away from each other as their shadows hit the projection behind them. The projection shows one of Yariko's segments from Garu Talk. You can tell from the text at the bottom saying Yariko, as well as the butterfly in the top left. Then the video changes to Pink Bitch Club when Minako is all alone in her room. The shot then changes to a shot of one of VYT's jewels falling and shattering apart. Then we cut to the shooting segment of Chino Squee, where we see Charlotte getting shot by her mother. We then get a frame of Minako as a part of a blue screen. A camera lens then appears, but the quality of the video is too low for me to make out what the lens is actually showing. The shot then cuts to a different shot of the camera, showing us Minako is the one holding it. We can tell it's her due to her hairstyle. P.S. If you want to tell me what you think was in the camera lens, please feel free to let me know. The original designs of the three girls then appear, Garako, Charlotte and VYT. However, whilst Garako is on screen, her eyes are filled with static, just like in Garu Talk. The shot then continues panning and removes the static. Then we get a shot of the girls as the colours have been altered to nothing but reds and blacks. The shot then changes again and begins panning to the right, revealing that Minako was at the back of the group all along. The camera then zooms in on Minako as the colours go haywire and a rotating brain is spinning behind her in the background. We get a close up of Minako's face as the colours change and code falls down the screen. Minako then appears in front of the projector one more time as we get flashes from Garako's and Charlotte's introduction from Pink Bitch Club, followed by what appears to be a strange close up of VYT's face. Then a flashback to the karaoke sequence from Pink Bitch Club. Then the glitch sequence from Pink Bitch Club. Minako then fills up the entire screen, quite similarly to the end of Minako's room, as the screen gets darker and fades to black. So, let's try to pin down what actually happened here. This video does a lot of things. It shows us different versions of each of the club members. It constantly references other videos in the Pink Bitch Club series through a warped and strange lens. Even though the title of the video is quite strange, psychedelic, does the title imply that members of the club are high on psychedelic substances? I personally don't think so. In my opinion, I'm not 100% sure what to make of this video. It helps answer a couple questions about the Pink Pitch Club, and helps strengthen the link between Minako and Garako, whilst at the same time, it raises a lot more questions than it answers. One possible idea that I had is that the new designs we saw of the club members are simply the same characters, but slightly older. In my opinion, Charlotte and Garako's design help back this up because I feel like they look a little bit older here. It might be the case that we're seeing older versions of these characters. This shot of Minako made me think that Minako feels abandoned by the other members of the Pink Bitch Club. She's struggling at the back of the group and is very much in her own world, hence the brain in the background. So personally, I see this video as showing us some of the club members of just Minako taking a look at the memories of the Pink Bitch Club Hence why we constantly see a projection, like an old film reel. And when we see Minako and Garako together, they're looking at their old memories. If Minako feels abandoned, it would explain the lines said in Yaru Talk. If I'm being honest, this relationship is getting a little tiring. Why don't we hang out less from now on? When this line is said, it was heavily distorted so we couldn't really make out who said it. Maybe Garako said it to Minako, hence why she's at the back of the group. As I said, this video is kind of hard to make out. 
The visuals are quite abstract and the narrative here is kind of all over the place in my opinion. So in conclusion, I see this video as showing us a glimpse into the future of the Pink Bitch Club as we seemingly see some of them slightly older, but that might just be the outfit change leading me to believe as such. It's still very possible that they're the same age, just in different costumes. It shows us Minako reliving some of the moments from the Pink Bitch Club's past, and out of the new designs, Minako is the one who changed the least, maybe highlighting hair not wanting to move on. My interpretation of this video is a bit fuzzy, so I'd appreciate hearing your thoughts in the comments below. Tomboroid is yet another animation from the Korean animation channel, Vivinos. This video, like the past six of their videos, centers around the exploits of the Pink Bitch Club and their members. In the past, we've had videos going over a little bit of lore about each of the characters, except VYT, until this video. Otomoroid gives a little bit more to go on in regards to who or what VYT is. Even with the title, Otomoroid, it comes from two words. Otome, meaning young girl or maiden, and the word android. Anyway, let's dive into this video and take a look at what happens and then break down and interpret what we actually saw. But before we do that, I have two things to say. In my opinion, this has the best music out of all the Pink Bitch Club songs so far. And this is the cutest thing in any Vivinos video by far. With all that out the way, let's get to the breakdown. The video starts off with plenty of cutesy imagery as VYT makes remarks such as I want to know, I want to feel, alluding to the fact that VYT may want to be more human. We see her in a couple of different outfits, playing with Pochita, yet again this is incredibly adorable. And then we see her put her maid outfit on, she and Pochi then fawn over some sweets, macaroons and castella. We are then met with an image that truly makes this one of if not my favourite Vivinos video ever. Deal with it glasses slowly move onto VYT's face as the words Fug Life appear below her. Upon my first viewing this kind of <laughs> caught me off guard and made me watch it a couple more times because it feels as if despite the overarching narrative of the Pink Bitch Club being quite negative filled with death and murder, this video is majorly light-hearted and quite funny and adorable. Anyway, back to the video itself. We then seemingly transition into VYT's mind as she imagines herself falling in love with her Prince Charming. My heart pounding the first time this has happened. Was it like this? We also get a shot of Pochita playing the drums in the middle of VYT's dream sequence. But in my opinion, it's pretty cool but doesn't really have any meaning besides it being adorable. We seemingly see her fall over or have an accident in her imagination. To then be lent a hand by her Prince Charming, whose face is being distorted with static. But we can assume that VYT is a fan of her Prince Charming, given the fact that she's holding a sign rating his face a 10 out of 10. As she is in her dream scenario, the line spoken suggests that she has never felt love before. She questions everything she feels. Was it like this? Hands and hands clapping. Huh, maybe this. This is a secret filled with syrup. The shot then pans down to show us VYT observing Minako as she sleeps seemingly midway through writing something. The cutesy, emotion-filled VYT from VYT's own imagination is gone. She's now stoic and emotionless, staring at Minako, her head seemingly cocked in curiosity, wondering what it's like to feel emotions. We then get a view of all of the members of the Pink Bitch Club, seemingly from VYT's perspective. Minako is either crying or yawning here. Yawning would make more sense as we've seen her waking up or asleep once before during her introduction of the beginning of the Pink Bitch Club video, aptly titled Pink Bitch Club. Gerico's face looks crudely drawn. I feel like the image of Gerico is parodying something, but I can't remember what. I thought it was parodying Pop Team Epic, but I'm not sure. If the art style looks familiar, I would really appreciate your thoughts. It wouldn't have a, an impact on my interpretation of the video, I'm just really curious of where this art style came from. It's kind of a similar situation with how Charlotte is shown here. Her art style seems to be mimicking old 80s anime. It reminds me most of revolutionary girl Utena, but maybe that's just me. And the final member of the Pink Bitch Club displayed in this shot is of course Pochita, the mascot of the group. However, for some reason, we only get a shot of his rear end. VYT then 
dances past the shot so that we can transition to VYT again staring at Minako as she sleeps. The backgrounds of these two shots are different. The second shot, after the shot of the Pink Bitch Club members from VYT's perspective, is darker, perhaps suggesting that VYT has been staring at Minako for an extended period of time, either overseeing her as she's programmed to do, or staring at her to try and figure out how to feel emotions like Minako. Throughout this staring session, we are met with lyrics such as My heart fills up, spinning around, error, chewing on plastic, a rainbow colour made to be sold. Out of all these lines, for some reason the line a rainbow colour meant to be sold stuck out to me. I personally feel like this line perfectly describes the cutesy idol culture in Japan, just like with the Pink Bitch Club. It's a cutesy group filled with colourful imagery, and clothes and high energy songs that are made to be sold. By my own admission, I'm probably looking too deep into that specific line, but it just stuck out to me. BYT moves towards the open window next to the sleeping Minako and goes to stare at the sunset. Pixelated versions of VYT float throughout the sky as the song's pace slows down and gets calmer. I want to reach out to your weak side. I want you to tell me everything. I can't understand, but I won't give up on this dream. These lyrics are seemingly VYT trying to get her emotions to cross to Minako about her wanting to feel more emotion and be more otome than android. She wants to be told everything. She wants to reach out to her weak side but she can't understand her emotions. However, she won't give up on trying to be able to. The lyrics up to this point are actually quite wholesome, depending on the way you look at them. I interpret the lyrics so far as being VYT's struggle to become more human, more like a normal girl. She doesn't think she'll be able to, but that won't stop her from trying to achieve her dream. She won't give up on her dream of becoming a normal girl and of falling in love with her Prince Charming. After this, VYT looks out of the window to see all the pixelated versions of herself falling down the sunset. We get a shot of an icon of VYT being dragged into a folder, along with a bright pink love heart icon. The shot then zooms in as the two seemingly fuse together and VYT is allowed to feel emotion. The screen glitches green as more floating discoloured VYTs appear. Then, for a couple of frames, they appear without their heads. We then get this cute imagery of a plush-like VYT being squeezed as her heart finally appears. The melody that goes through my head, only the fruit trees of the swaying stars. We see VYT in a schoolgirl outfit, eyes closed as the solid imagery flies past her. The file icon from the previous shot, an old Windows XP style error message, click to fix error, as well as pixelated stars and sparkles. We then strangely cut to a, like, a TikTok or YouTube shorts type video of Pochita dancing. We cut back to VYT with her eyes closed as more imagery falls around her. A pixelated Pochita from the previous shot, as well as a magical girl Pochita from the Pink Bitch Club video. As we reach the bottom of the shot, we see Minako hiding at the bottom left of the screen, until she then jump scares the camera as the screen becomes more pixelated and monochrome. We then see VYT put her hair into twin tails, but now her eyes are different. We then see her imitate a few things from the previous Pink Bitch Club videos. The video in the middle is from Onigiri Dance. You can see it more clearly in some of the images that Vivinos released around the time of Onigiri Dance's release. The image on the right seems to be imitating Minako from Gyaru Talk, from the intro when Minako is putting on her makeup. The image on the left is a bit more unknown. It might just be me, but I'm not sure what the image on the left is imitating, if anything at all. I would really appreciate knowing what she's mimicking here, so if you have any idea, please feel free to let me know in the comments below. We then see another TikTok-esque video, utilising the previous shot of VYT in her Onigiri dance attire, until the video turns off and we get a reflection of VYT on her phone screen. We then get another cute shot as VYT and Pochi explode out of a rainbow with a love heart in the background. I don't know anything, but I don't want to wake up now. Soft and lovely fragrance just for you. We then get a chibi VYT along with two dancing pochitas as cutesy versions of VYT are shown in the background. We see Minako as she faces away from the camera. Chat boxes appear around her filled with static, a common signifier in videos of the Pink Bitch Club. Static imagery is prevalent throughout the entire series of videos now that I think about it. We then get the shot of Minako mirrored but with VYT in the center instead of Minako, except this time she is facing the camera, smiling with a sparkle in her eyes. 
Numerous social media posts and profiles fill VYT's chat boxes, unlike the static that filled Minako's. We see Onigiri dance being played. The shot of VYT when she was imitating the other Pink Bitch Club videos is on the left. We have a Twitter post from Q Meng, one of the major driving forces behind creating Vivino's videos. We also have an Instagram post of a cat and a chat log. A TikTok profile is also shown, Pink Bitch Club 6. It doesn't seem to have anything strange on the profile. It seems to be just the official TikTok for the Pink Bitch Club. If you can find the Instagram post shown here, please put a link to it in the comments. We then see Minako turn around, and the first verse of the song is then repeated, along with another adorable shot of Pochi and VYT. However, despite the overall cutesy and funny atmosphere of the song and video, we get a shot of Minako unplugging VYT. Her eyes lose the sparkling glimmer she gained after the Love Heart program, and she goes dead again. She becomes stoic. As her head leans forward, the subtitles then glitch and the phrase she was right then briefly appears as the text glitches away and the video turns to black. So, time for the question I always ask when making a video about Vivino's. What just happened? The video seemingly shows us the journey of VYT wanting to become more human like Minako and wanting to feel more emotion. This culminates in her getting some sort of program installed. We can tell that from the small graphic of the Love Heart and VYT being put in the same folder. Another important thing that demonstrates a change in VYT is her eyes. Whenever VYT isn't in her own imagination, we get a blank stare, void of emotion. However, during her dreams, as well as after the love program is installed, she gains more life, she feels emotion, there is a literal sparkle in her eye. Just look at these repeated shots from the beginning and the end of the song. These shots are from the repeated verses, from the intro and outro of the song. They're the same shots, but one is after the heart program and one is before. One has a sparkle in its eye and the other does not. And when she has a sparkle in her eye, she also has a slight blush. So during the video, VYT has a significant change. She gains emotion. Whether or not it's from an installed program or she gained emotion herself, whether or not she installed a program herself or Minako did is unclear. However, whether or not VYT did it herself or Minako did doesn't really matter because they both would have led to the same result. It seems that after this change in VYT, Minako either didn't like the change in VYT or got jealous of the attention she was getting. This is further demonstrated by the static in the text boxes that surround her. They're empty, whilst VYTs are filled with attention. As with most of my readings with Vivino's videos, there are a couple of ways to interpret this video. You could view this video as a story of VYT growing and gaining emotions and over time or due to a heart program that she installed herself, she gains the ability to feel emotions and express them. This leads to her gaining more attention, causing Minako to get jealous of said attention and unplug her. The lyrics do kind of imply that she did it herself due to the fact that the lyrics pretty much entirely centre around her want for emotions. So for Minako to give VYT the ability to feel emotions just to immediately snatch them away seems less likely to me, in my personal opinion. I see it as being more likely that VYT gained emotions on her own, maybe by installing the programs herself, and then after Minako sees how it changed VYT to become more favoured than her, she then, as a result of this, snatches away VYT's ability to feel anything. It would make more sense if VYT did it on her own for another reason. When the program is first installed, we get a black and white jump scare of Minako. Why would Minako be seemingly so angry towards VYT and the audience in a sense if she willingly gave her the ability to feel and express emotions? However, you could interpret this video in a multitude of different ways. One thing, however, in this video that really stuck out to me is the phrase, she was right. Who was right? Who is she? Which she? I'm really unsure of what this phrase is alluding to, and I would really appreciate your help on finding out, so please leave your thoughts in the comments below. So, in conclusion, Otomoroid is the first video in Vivinos' Pink Bitch Club catalogue that focuses on VYT. It seemingly delves into VYT wanting to become more human, which she does, but only to her own detriment, leading to Minako unplugging and deactivating her. Despite that, however, it has become one of, if not my favourite, Vivinos video ever, due to its random nature with outdated memes that make me feel nostalgic, as well as some of the most adorable imagery I've ever seen. I think this video, however, has resolved one of the greatest questions in the Vivinos fandom, if you could say. We can finally say it without a shadow of a doubt, VYT is 
best gal. The Escape in a Dream. As of writing the script for this video, it's the latest animation from the Korean animation channel, Vivinos. It's also somewhat of a return of form for Vivinos as the mass majority of previous videos from them have all been in relation to the Pink Bitch Club, an animated idol group of four girls and their mascot, Pochi. If you want to learn more about them, please feel free to check out my other videos on them after this. Anyway, back to The Escape in a Dream. Vivinos likes to categorise their videos by the emojis that they use in a video's title. For example, titles that you have sparkly love hearts are one of Vivinos' much tamer music videos with cutesy, light-hearted visuals and no real narrative attached most of the time. Videos that have a love heart that isn't simply red are part of the Pink Bitch Club series, so if they have a broken heart, a black heart or a pebble heart, they are part of the Pink Bitch Club narrative. But if they have a caution sign, they are more horror or psychological scented music videos. These are seemingly the most popular on Vivinos' channel overall. The reason I bring up all the different types of Vivinos videos is the fact that we haven't received a caution sign video in around five to six months. So, to be honest, I was really excited and intrigued when I saw the trailer for this video. It seemed to follow the archetypes most of the other Vivinos caution sign videos do. It follows the story of two females, something tragic seemingly happens to one of them, as well as the most important feature of all Vivinos videos, a boatload of symbolic imagery. Anyway, enough about me rambling about how much I love Vivinos' symbolic imagery in her videos, so I can talk about Vivinos' symbolic imagery in this specific video. So, let's discuss the escape in a dream. Also, one quick thing of note is that some godly being, maybe some random person or Vivinos themselves, went through and gave this video English subtitles so I don't have to use auto-translation, which is notoriously inaccurate sometimes. Whoever did it, you've made my life a little easier. Thank you. Back to the actual video. Out of the smorgasbord of Vivinos videos, I personally feel that this is one of the easiest to grasp and understand the narrative of. I feel, personally, that it's relatively simplistic, despite the bombastic nature of the visuals. The video begins with two girls standing in a field, distance from each other. The colour palette is quite muted, only greys and browns. The exception to this is the sun, roaring in the background, giving the shot some light. The colour palette reminded me a bit of a more toned down version of Jordan River, but anyway, I digress. The short haired girl in the front feels the grass as the wind bellowing makes it shiver through her fingertips, ignoring the person behind them. Meanwhile, the long-haired girl simply stares at the short-haired girl from a distance. No lyrics are spoken during this section, just the song's intro playing. We cut to a classroom. We see a girl, glasses, quietly writing or drawing something at her desk, left alone in the abyss. We then cut to see three girls chatting and laughing with each other, the girl in the centre being much more visually distinct. On top of that, the girls to the left and the right of her lack eyes and any defined characteristics, meaning that it's more than likely that the girl in the centre will be an important character. Regret, full of sighs. For argument's sake, let's call these two girls glasses and jacket, just to make things a bit easier to understand. We get a closer shot of what glasses was doing, as we get a shot of her and her desk from above. She was drawing something. It seems to be some kind of dress. We see glasses walking behind jacket as she talks to her classmates. The lyrics help demonstrate this. Hidden behind. We see Jacket's classmate completely walk past and ignore glasses as the background becomes black. Your regrets. Looking at me. The background shifts to a red thread as the two walk whilst distance from each other. The background changes to white, making it appear as if these are more happy memories. We then get a short little montage showing us the past relationship of these two. They appear to be childhood friends. They cut fabrics and make clothes together. We see them at what appears to be their final day of middle school or their first day of high school. The two of them look quite happy, distant and forgotten memories. The two girls flick through fashion magazines together, but then we see Glasses present Jacket with a new design for a dress, much to Jacket's shock. It's so mixed, I, I can't remember our go away. We see Jacket bite her lip in anger, which is quickly followed by the dress being destroyed. Glasses is then bullied by the rest of her classmates, whilst Jacket ignores her. Glasses' desk is destroyed and defaced, and people surround her as she weeps on the floor, implying that maybe Jacket is to blame. Now knock it off. 
your one-sided contract. Throw it away. Jacket watches as Glasses sobs alone in the classroom, her face stoic and unfeeling. A happier memory then appears, as it seems that Jacket won a dress design competition or something similar, with Glasses cheering her on as she gets her award. Glasses can't draw. She lost her passion for designing clothes. She tries, but snaps her pencil in frustration. Now exhausted, I'm the flame that burns you. We get another montage, showing us the life of Jacket from her high school to her adult life, getting older, gaining multiple accolades, medals and certificates. The hell is that? That's what the fuck. We then see much older glasses, seeing her ex-friend on the cover of a magazine, her face blank, a silent rage filling her. The shot pulls out to show us that she is now working the register at a convenience store. The traffic lights go green, and we are met with glasses walking home from work, curiously viewing her surroundings. Jacket is everywhere. Her face adorns every ad on every building, her clothes filling every window of every storefront. She seems to be opening her own store soon. The date shown for this is the 14th of November 2011. If you have any idea of the significance of this date, please let me know because I'm quite unsure myself. We can see that Jacket is selling Glasses All Design as her own, gaining more fame and fortune from Glasses' work. Glasses gazes up in a daze, seeing Jacket everywhere until a bright light appears behind her. A bus crashes into her. Even the bus itself is filled with ads of jacket, but then the bus warps around glasses, and ironically glass shatters all around her as the bus flips over her. The number four bus. Maybe this links into the fact that in Korea, the number four is seen as bad luck, as in Korean it sounds similar to the word for death, which is a case in a few Asian countries. Glasses' life flashes before her eyes, however, it's not her life. She sees her perfect ideal life. The life where she won the design competition herself. The life where her dress was seen on walkways. The life where she won fame and glory due to her talents instead of jacket. We then see what her reality was actually like. Alone, in the field, with nothing but her dress behind her. No accolades or recognition gained. The wall filled with awards is empty, with no one standing before it. We see the red thread from earlier growing weaker and weaker. On the verge of snapping, we see the two girls happily in their ideal lives, going from child to adult, maintaining their smiles. Until Jacket's smile grows wider and Glasses grows shocked. We get another close-up of the tired and bitter Glasses with bags under her eyes with a background filled with red behind her. We snap back to reality, seeing the bus close in on Glasses in her final moments, as the life she could have lived flashed before her very eyes. The camera slowly tilts up as we see passerbys looking on in terror, phoning for an ambulance. As the camera continues to climb up, we are again met with ad after ad of Jacket's new store, confirming that what we just saw was unfortunately all a dream in Glasses' head. The field from the intro. We see it again. The girl in the front turns around. We can assume that the girl in front is Jacket and the girl behind is Glasses for a few reasons mainly due to the continued imagery of Glasses always being behind Jacket, and we know that the person in the back is Glasses due to them both wearing a plain white dress when in the grassy field. Jacket turns around, the music fades, until all that can be heard is a whistling in the wind. The ambience of the wind, as well as the visuals, cut to black, ending the video. So yet again, I ask you, dear viewer, what just happened? In my opinion, what we see in the video is pretty straightforward with a few minor caveats and intriguing symbolic visual metaphors. The narrative follows the two characters of Glasses and Jacket. <laughs> Creative names, I know. We see the relationship between these two characters in a non-linear way, meaning that we don't see it in a chronological order. We see the two on rocky terms in high school, then cut back to their childhood when the two are good friends, back to high school in which Glasses is horribly bullied, and then to the future in which Jacket steals Glasses' dress design, as well as gain fame and notoriety whilst Glasses lives a quiet life filled with mundanity in which she can't express her own talents, culminating with Glasses being hit by an oncoming bus whilst she stares apathetically at Jacket's ads all over the surrounding city. Whilst dying, her ideal dream life flashes before her eyes until reality hits her and she dies on the street, seemingly all alone. That interpretation so far is pretty much as ironclad as it can get in a Vivino's video, and in my opinion, the hardest thing to debate over in, in regards to readings of this video is some of the imagery throughout the video. That's a, that's a bit more debatable. 
For example, the red string or the red thread that is shown in a couple shots. I personally interpret these shots as being the red string of fate or the red thread of fate. It's an old legend that varies depending on which country tells the legend. However, the red string of fate can connect either to lovers, to friends, or even something as simple as two people who have something to learn from each other. But the most common portrayal of the red string of fate usually has the portrayal be more inclined with the first two than the last meaning. More than likely meaning the red string is connecting two friends or lovers. So when we see Glasses' dream sequence and we see the red string of fate snap, it could simply be further evidence of Glasses' death as the red string of fate is supposed to be unbreakable. There are a couple other ways you could interpret the red thread, so please let me know your thoughts below. The other major point of differing interpretations is the opening and ending shots of the video. Where is this grassy field? Or rather, what does it represent? To be perfectly honest, the only real conclusion I could think of is the afterlife. As soon as I saw the opening shot, it reminded me of the ending of Gladiator. Sorry to the younger and uncultured people who haven't seen Gladiator to its ending moments, but in the climax and end of the film, the afterlife, or Elysium, as seen in Greek lore, is portrayed as a seemingly infinite grassy field. However, there is the possibility that this shot isn't representing the afterlife, with the case of the Vivinos video. For example, if it's the afterlife, why is Jacket seemingly here? Why can she turn around when she apparently isn't dead? Despite this, however, I still view these shots as representing the afterlife, but let me know what you think of these intro and outro shots. So, in conclusion, the narrative of this video is one of the more simplest stories told by Vivinos, but that necessarily isn't a bad thing. I very much enjoyed the video and hope you did too. It was a nice break in between the onslaught of Pink Bitch videos before this release, as well as the inevitable tidal wave of Pink Bitch videos that will follow this one. If you've followed my channel for a while, you'll be aware that I've grown quite acquainted with Vivinos and their videos, especially when it comes to Vivinos's de facto idol group, The Pink Club. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at Vivinos's most recent video as of writing this script. The video I'm referring to, I will call Gal for Bravity's sake, or as the Garako video. And I, at some point in the future, will also be taking a look at Vivinos's video uploaded on April 1st or April Fool's Day, which is a gender bent Rule 64 version of the Pink Club, known as the Cherry Club. Whilst I personally don't think the April Fool's video of the Cherry Club has any real impact on the story of Vivinos and the Pink Club overall, I still think it's quite intriguing and there are a couple things of note to be said about that video, so I'll take a look at the Cherry Club in another video. Anyway, let's get started by taking a look at the latest video in the Pink Club saga, a video that is focused on Garako that I will be calling Gal. Before I analyse the video itself, however, there is something of note. With the creation of Gal, we have now been given a video focusing on each member of the Pink Club. There was Chino Squee focusing on Charlotte, or Tomoroid focusing on my personal favourite, VYT. Now we have Gal centering around Garako. And of course, there's plenty of videos that focus on Minako. So that means that now every character in the club has had a little bit of backstory of their past shown. So, anyway, let's make way into the actual video. The video itself starts off with Garako walking alone in the rain with a yellow umbrella and coming across a lone kitten in a box, which is a pretty common trope in anime and stuff like that, which is why I found this intro a little bit funny. Garako, then seeing how adorable this cat is, blushes a little bit, puts her umbrella over the cat and decides to try and pet it, only for the cat to then angrily bite her hand as the camera then freeze frames and the title card comes in. Just from this shot of Garako from behind, we can get a lot of information about how different Garako is at this point when we see her and how different she is to when she's in the other pink club videos just from the jacket she's wearing at this point in time Garako is a bosuzoku or the member of a specific type of biker gang member from Japan we can decipher this detail due to the embroidery on the back which was synonymous with bosuzoku S apologies for the terrible pronunciation also the the plot of the video itself helps reinforce this idea of Bosuzoku. Also, if possible, if there are any 
Japanese speakers or anyone out there who can accurately translate what the writing on her back says, I'd be really intrigued to find out, so please, if possible, could you let me know? Anyway, the video continues with the song in the background having its lyrics kick in as we see a silhouette of Garako atop a hill as waves crash as she stands in front of the sun. The shot somewhat reminded me of the opening of Chino Squee, but I feel like that's just a passing resemblance. The camera then slowly zooms in as we get cutaways of Garako stretching her arms until we finally get a close up of her as we see her features hidden in shadow. Until the shots flash on screen and we see her in full light. We get this one shot where she's animated and it reminds me of the revolver back in Chino Squee as well. As a lot of Vivinos' videos are more so animatics than animations, shots like these really stick out, but they've only really been appearing relatively recently. Anyway. It just reminded me of the revolver in Chino Squee, I thought that was of note. Anyway, Geriko's gang. We see Geriko herself with a pipe, her friend next to her with spiked brass knuckles. Since the girl with brass knuckles has some plot relevance, we'll call her Ginger, so the narrative is easier to understand. However, the final member of the gang in the background with the pinkish purplish hair and on their motorcycle, they don't seem to be too relevant in the plot, and in my opinion, so I'll leave her unnamed despite how memorable she seems here. A beaten and injured Garako then sits alone under a tree, as the cat from the intro appears and approaches her in a very cutesy way. The two other members of her gang then approach her with a drink, offering it to Garako. The shot then tilts up to a red sky, which seems to be becoming a small pattern in a couple of Vivino's videos. I keep seeing this aesthetic of the red sky, anyway. We then see a comic book style shot as the camera slowly pans to the right. We see a boy with glasses in a dark alley about to be attacked until Garako appears calling out the bullies and appearing with a tada. Then we see the thumbnail shot of Garako and her gang together as we get another shot that tilts from their knees up to their faces. We then see the three riding along on their motorbikes as the sun sets in the background. Garako talks and looks to her friend Ginger behind her, which isn't really safe to be honest, you know, talking and looking behind you while driving, but anyway, when Ginger looks back at Garako, her face seems uneasy, in my opinion. We find out that the three of them were driving to a meeting spot so that Garako and her rival gang could have a brawl. We see the opposing gang on the left, similarly to Garako's gang. A lot of the characters here aren't really worth mentioning. We have a blonde haired character with glasses and another character with pinkish hair. These characters are whatever, but their leader. Let's call them Rival. Creative, I know. I call it this just because she's in the same spot as Garako in this little versus screen, but on the opposite side. She has a white coat instead of black. She has black hair instead of blonde and blue eyes instead of brown. She's pretty much kind of like a reflection of Garako. We then get this little versus graphic, then the fight ensues. We see Garako tighten her grip around her pipe. We see Ginger fight a member of the rival gang, whilst Garako beats up the white coat member with glasses. Ginger and her opponent look at Garako instead of each other. Ginger then pulls out a knife, much to Garako's shock. We then see Garako bleeding on the ground, surrounded by both her supposed friends and enemies. They then laugh at her and then leave her for dead. Judging by the silhouettes that gathered around Garako as she was on the floor, we can gather that the people laughing at her are rival. Ginger and Garako's other fellow gang member just due to the size of their hair. We then get another comic book style panel going from left to right. Garako struggles to get up after being stabbed. She looks down and reels at the blood coming from her wound, thinking back on her friends that betrayed her. The line that's said here is also quite interesting. Uh, according to the translation from Charlotte PBC, uh, thank you for making this translation by the way, the line here is, don't hesitate for your colleagues. I imagine that this is too direct of a translation and in context probably means something like don't hesitate for your friends, but that's what I think anyway, but I don't know Japanese or Korean so take it with a heap of salt. Either way, I feel like that specific line has a meaning to it in regards to the context of the gal video. Anyway, the comic style shot ends on the right with Garako crying alone over her betrayal until she then gets cartoonishly angry as the camera zooms in on her face filled with tears and sharpened teeth. Garako's ex-friends seem to be having a good time, bonding over a drink like the group did together before, until they are then interrupted by Garako coming back for revenge. Garako with her eyes glowing with 
flames of rage burning behind her. She proceeds to then beat up those who betrayed her. So much so that they tend into background characters lacking any features with only X's over their eyes. Possibly meaning that Garakor killed them, but given the comedic tone that the video goes for, as well as the lack of blood around them, I don't think so. It's possible, but I personally don't think that they were killed. Garakor then tries to walk away, but after the damage she sustained, she struggles to move. She collapses to the ground. The shot from the outro is then mirrored. We see Minako come to over towards the dying Garakor, attempting to maybe lend a hand in assistance. But Garako just mirrors the actions of the cat from the video's introduction, biting Minako's hand, maybe symbolising how Garako doesn't trust anyone as a friend anymore, and has become suspicious of even those who are trying to help her. The video then cuts to black and ends. It's possible that the cat acts as a reflection of Garako in the future, warming up to Minako after she's been helped, but I don't know, maybe that's just a thought. So, in this video overall, the main players in the narrative are as such. Gyarako, Jinja, Rival, and Minako. And also maybe the cat because I love its goofy stupid face. You may be wondering why only some of the Boshuzoku shown in the video are important and have been given code names by me and some haven't. Well, allow me to explain why with a single image because they said image speaks a thousand words. This image from Vivinos' community page kind of paints the narrative of this video in a completely different light. This image shows us the reasoning behind Ginger's betrayal. It's more than likely as a result of her being in love with Rival. One of the things the video was missing was a motive for the betrayal, but this image gives us, as the audience, more of an inkling behind that motive. One other thing of note that doesn't really fit anywhere in the script is that this video was kind of foreshadowed a little bit a couple months ago. With the release of Vivinos' video, Psychedelic in which we see Garako dressed as a biker, with what seems to be a pixelated bike in the background. It doesn't really have much bearing on the plot of the Gal video, but I think it was something of note. So, overall, I personally think that this video acts as a prequel showing us Garako's life just before she met Minako. This is further enforced by how Garako acts towards Minako in this video. She acts like the cat did during the introduction, treating a stranger attempting to help them with a bite on the hand. I do have one problem with this video overall though. I feel like the video lacked a consistent tone. It, what I mean by this is that when Garako is stabbed and betrayed by those who were closest to her, it's played off relatively seriously through the visuals and that makes sense. However, when Garako gets revenge, she then beats up the people who betrayed her and in my opinion it's played off too comically and lacks like the darker tones and aesthetics that Vivinos became popular for. This doesn't mean I hate the video or even dislike the video for the matter, it's kind of the opposite. I very much enjoyed and besides that one issue, I thought the video was very entertaining. And also some people may agree or disagree with this statement but a couple of the past Vivino songs that have been from the Pink Club, specifically Otomoroid, Onigiri Dance and Gal, in my opinion I feel like they have the best music out of all of Vivinos' videos but that's just what I think. It's just really upbeat and happy and I've always liked the Boshuzoku aesthetic so it was a great pick for me. Also if you really like this like biker gang aesthetic feel free to try out Great Teacher Onizuka or Tokyo Revengers. Similar kind of aesthetic of old Japanese biker gangs. Anyway, time to do my outro. On April 1st of 2022, otherwise known as April Fool's Day, the Korean animation channel Vivinos released a Rule 63 parody of their previously established video known as The Pink Club. This time, instead of being a club made exclusively of females as an idol group, the new video, The Cherry Club, has the idol group gender swapped, having the group consist of male versions of their female counterparts. In my opinion, The Cherry Club video doesn't have too many implications within the overall narrative of Vivinos. I personally just see it as a cool and simple April Fool's Day video. However, there are a few things to note about the video, as well as how it differs from the original Pink Club video. Now I'll take a look at the very clear and obvious differences between the two videos, then I'll try and go in depth on the video and try to explain the not so subtle differences between the two videos, and then I'll finally go into some of my own thoughts as well as the future of the Cherry Club, because I'm not 100% sure that it is 
only just a singular video featuring them. First of all, let's get the obvious stuff out of the way. Everything is reversed. Minato instead of Minako, Gyaruo instead of Gyaruko, the mouth of Amuth instead of Charlotte, and R18 instead of VYT. We also get this new mascot character. Instead of our beloved Pochita, we have this cool little cat instead. Also, in a nutshell, the design philosophy behind these characters also seem to have changed a bit from the original group. Whilst the Pink Club's character design seemed to be based around fashion trends in Japan and tying them into an idol group format, for example, Gyaru and Lolita, with the Cherry Club, the design seems to be more K pop inspired. I personally just got this kind of feel from it that it had this kind of aesthetic due to Minato's dangling earring, as well as Gyaro's open shirt. R18 seems to be a kind of deviation from this aesthetic, however, as he simply just looks like a butler with a cutie apron with a flower on. Another major difference that is pretty obvious, but I feel like have to mention, the audio. The song itself, since the group is no longer exclusively females and now is exclusively males, the lyrics are now being performed by a male singer. Also, from what I can tell, the lyrics have minor changes for obvious reasons, such as my name is Minato instead of the line my name is Minako. However, I can't tell if there's a more significant difference between the lyrics from each of the videos, because every translation I find from the Pink Club and the Cherry Club have minor differences between each other so no two translations are consistent, so it kind of makes it hard to tell if the lyrics are significantly different between the two versions that are more than just surface level. Another quick aesthetic level thing to mention before I move on to some of the more deeper changes between the two videos is the fact that the colour palette's changed. The Pink Club, for obvious reasons, has a colour palette consisting of pink and sh other shades of pink, and the male version, known as the Cherry Club, has a colour palette consisting of shades of red, so things like the intro, the background and character icons flash on screen, as well as the glitched sequence have more reds than pinks in the cherry video. Garako then makes love heart eyes at the camera, whilst Gyaro looks at it then blushes. Also a minor difference in this shot is the order that the characters are lined up in the background. It's slightly different between each version. Charlotte, then VYT on the left, then Minako on the right. So that should mean that it should be mirrored in the cherry club, but it isn't. It has R18, then Vermouth of a mouth on the left, even though it should be the mouth, then R18. Then we get some random shots of cutie imagery. We have fingernails and then someone applying lipstick in Pink Club. And then in Cherry Club, we have a love heart Tamagotchi, followed by someone pulling back their cheek and showing their teeth. And finally, in both, we have a shot of a gun. But the guns have some minor differences. Besides the obvious, the colours being red and pink, the love hearts and cherries, as well as the caution tape. At first glance, the guns kind of look like Glocks. But for some reason, the gun in the Cherry Club has a hammer, the part at the back of the gun that you pull back, but the one in the Pink Club video doesn't. It doesn't really mean anything, I just thought it was an intriguing thought because Glocks are known for not having hammers. Also, the one on the left has a dolphin and the one on the right has a shark. Since there are a lot of cases of cherry icons being used instead of love hearts or something else, I'll stop bringing them up because they're incredibly obvious, so I'll bring up some of the more intriguing differences instead of something as boring and surface level as a cherry being used instead of a star or something. Anyway, we then get to the character introductions of Minako and Minato as well as Gyaruko slash Gyauro. The only real thing of note is that despite the character's designs being significantly different, they keep the same borders around the edges of the introduction. Also, both sets of characters are in very different poses. The two groups then go to karaoke. There are a couple differences here. Minako and Gyuriko are singing together whilst Minato is singing alone in the cherry club. Well, I guess. It looks like Vermouth is quietly singing along in the background. Another difference is that VYT is happily banging on a tambourine in the back whilst R18 is just kinda sleeping aggressively. The next notable difference is that the introduction for R18 is really long for some reason. This shot just kind of lingers, so this shot of Minato laughing with his friends feels like it's cut really short, whilst in the Pink Club, the shot of VYT is a lot shorter, meaning that we get the full shot of Minako laughing with their friends. We pretty much get the next shots as closely paralleled as they can be until we get the icons representing each character. First we get shots of Garako's animal print clothes and Garawo's basketball. Then we get Charlotte's teddy, however, we get a cherry in the cherry video. However, we get a cherry in the male video. Then we have VYT's heart, but in Cherry Globe we get Vermouth's snake. Meaning that we don't really have an icon representing R18. We get the cherry icon, but that could literally represent anyone in the Cherry Club. We then get a mascot character appearing and taking the main character out of their dark and depressing rooms. Now we have the largest difference between the two videos. In the Pink Club, we get a montage of Minako dressed as all of her friends. 
whilst in the cherry club we get a random compilation like a little montage of the group dressed in different clothes first of which we have the group seemingly dressed for basketball which makes sense given garawa's icon then we get the thumbnail shot of minako holding a cherry that's all i'm gonna say about this image the next shot is kind of goofy we have minato dressed as r18 R18 dressed as VYT's new design, whilst Garo is dressed in VYT's old design, her old maid costume. We then finish this little compilation slash montage with Vermouth in the field position. This also means that the Cherry Club video has one more shot in its compilation, as when we see Minako dressed as each of her friends, there are three separate shots, but in Cherry, we have four separate shots. This is followed up with the two vids having a glitched sequence, followed by the shots of the band members' deaths. The Gyaru is dead in the bath, Vermouth and Charlotte die after letting go of something close to them, Charlotte with her teddy and Vermouth with his cross. The two robots are left with holes in their chests and their hearts removed, and the video ends with the two main characters smirking at the camera as a love heart transitions into the ending credits. Overall the two videos are reflections of each other, and are similar almost to the point of parody, and I gather that was the point given its release was on April Fool's Day. However, despite this, there is something of note I need to mention. One of the minds behind the Pink Club and all projects relating to Vividos really is Qmeng, and on their channel, through their community page, they've released a few little web comic styled skits about the Cherry Club. If you look at the translations in the comments, they're actually <laughs> quite funny. They seemingly follow Minato trying to get people to join the Cherry Club, forcing Yarawa to sign up with a blood contract. <laughs> God damn. The mouth is just sitting there, Jojo posing when he's being asked, and Minato just forces R18 into it, which explains how passive aggressive he acts during the video, smacking Minato awake and going to sleep instead of singing. I don't know why, but in my opinion, why are the robot servants the best characters in these videos? In conclusion, it's possible that this isn't the end for the Cherry Club. It's possible that the character's story may be continued on Q Meng's channel, since the comics are exclusive to their channel, and if you look at Vivianos' old community page, she directs people to Q Meng's channel if they want to see more of the Cherry Club, as Q Meng is the one who directed the Cherry Club video, so it's possible that we might get more of them in the future. But it is more than likely that Vivinos will focus on the Pink Club more than anything, but only time will tell. So yeah, that was everything I could really tell you about the Cherry Bitch Club. If I missed something, please feel free to tell me in the comments below, and now time for the outro. Where is Vivinos? Uh, Korea. Something happened to them? No. no. Did they die? No. no. Why, why would you ask that? Why haven't they uploaded in four months? Uh, aliens and Yaoi. Well, I, I thought that was a perfectly understandable explanation, but I, I guess I'll give you some more details. It's been over four months since Vivinos released their most recent video, The Cherry Bitch Club, a gender-bent version of their previous music video, The Pink Bitch Club. Ever since then, no other YouTube video has been released on Vivinos' channel. Well, what about Q-Meng, I hear you ask? What's with all these questions? Those who run aware, Vivinos isn't just a single person. It has a couple people behind the scenes working to create the music videos and artwork for YouTube. Q-Meng is one of the most important people that are involved on the Vivinos projects, besides Vivinos herself. But from what I can tell, the last Vivinos related video posted on Q-Meng's channel was a behind the scenes stream of her creating some Cherry Bitch Club comics which I mentioned in my own video discussing the topic of the Cherry Bitch Club that you can also check out here. And since she made that stream it seems like there hasn't really been anything Vivinos related uploaded to her channel since, mainly just her streaming her own work. Since I don't speak Korean I can't be 100% sure that the stuff they've been making on their channel on their streams for the past three months isn't entirely not Vivinos related. However, from what I could tell, all the stuff she's drawn looks nothing like the stuff Vivinos has advertised on her channel, so I don't know, it's kind of up in the air. However, yes, there is more on the pipeline for Vivinos' YouTube channel. Whilst it hasn't been actively posting videos, it has, however, been making community posts relatively frequently, all of which advertise something that Vivinos has been working on. They even changed their channel background to advertise this. Alien stage is seemingly the next thing in the pipeline for Vivinos' next video, and from the looks of it, it might try and return to some of the more creepy aesthetics that got me interested in Vivinos in the first place. However, Vivinos did heavily advertise their Patreon also on their community page, so I got curious to see what was on the way, so 
I bit the bullet and I paid for a month on Patreon despite my bank account pleading me not to. Obviously I can't show you what's on there or at least too much of it, but what I can say is this. The Alien Stage music video, at least it looks like a music video from what I can tell, should be coming out relatively soon. If I had to put a number on it, earliest the 15th of August, latest the 30th. As Vivinos has stated on the community page and on Twitter, that it will be coming out at some point during the month of August. And also keep in mind, for some reason a lot of Vivinos' YouTube videos get released on Tuesdays, I think? From what I can remember from premieres, so keep that in mind as well, I guess. Also, all the promotional material shows us this girl, who looks somewhat familiar to other characters from Vivinos' library. Maybe it's something more than just a passing resemblance, or maybe it's just someone completely different just due to Vivinos' art style. Only time will tell us right now. Now on to the yaoi. So basically I was scrolling through Twitter and thinking about how long it had been since I made my last Vivinos video, since I've been uploading a couple random things recently. So then I checked YouTube to see if they really hadn't uploaded anything in that long, and then once I saw that nothing had been released in the past four months, I proceeded to check their Twitter, because they always seemed relatively active on Twitter. And then I looked to see if there were any updates on any new projects that Vivinos might be, you know, working on. Only for me to see this. <gasps> Gasp! Yeah, so apparently they've been making some, like, yaoi comics or something, I guess. And people have been making fan art of the characters from the yaoi, which, which is fair enough, I, I guess. However, the art style is just so unsettlingly Vivinos to me. It just kind of threw me for a loop, because when I see these horny images all over Twitter, all I could think about was all the other weird stuff on Vivinos' channel, and the weird thematic clash it kind of caused in my brain. But, anyway, my opinion on this art is, it ain't for me, but... It, you're free to look at it if you want. It's not my cup of tea, even if it is Vivinos. So let me just give you a quick overall synopsis on everything that Vivinos has been up to over the past few months. So since their last upload, Vivinos has been working on multiple projects at once, or at least so it seems, including that of the one that I stated previously, Alien Stage, as well as the aforementioned Yaoi art or webcomic or whatever this is. I'm not sure what, it, what this yaoi stuff is, to be honest. I mean, I know what yaoi is, but I don't know what this is in relation to Vivinos. Also, in one of Vivinos' community posts, they say that, that the release of Alien Stage is not the end of the Pink Witch Club, meaning that they may also have been working on a video alongside Alien Stage that focuses on the Pink Witch Club. From what I can tell, I feel that I can say that Alien Stage, quite confidently, has nothing to do with the Pink Bitch Club, or the PBC, I guess due to the community post saying that this is a new series. So now we have even more things to look out for. Three bands on Vivinos' channel now. So we have whatever this girl is a part of, the SUA, I guess, whatever that means, I think. The Pink Bitch Club, obviously. And the Cherry Bitch Club as well. On top of all the other creepy stuff that Vivinos randomly decides to upload once in a while. I mean, the stuff that I really care about. Like, the stuff I care about most on her channel, to be honest. The horror stuff has always been the main draw for me. And as time has passed, less and less horror-centric and thematically spooky videos from Vivinos have been coming out. And as a result, Vivinos is becoming less and less interesting to me, to be honest. With that being said, from some of the, like, Patreon artwork I've seen for Alien Stage, as well as some of the promotional material, it seems that Alien Stage might be somewhat dystopian, so I might find it particularly interesting. I'll probably make a video on it either way, but only time will tell us right now. That's what Vivinos has been up to for the past couple months. Guess we've just got to wait and see now. <laughs> Outro time. So yeah, it looks like I might have to finally cover another Vivinos video again for the first time in... ages. I mean, look, I'm not complaining. Look at my channel views when I don't cover Vivinos. <laughs> just thank you for watching my videos, not complaining. Alien Stage is the latest project from the Korean animation channel, Vivinos, and Alien Stage has been the channel's first video in around 5 months, their last previous video being the Cherry Bush Club. However, it seems that Alien Stage is completely different from anything Vivinos has done in the past, mixing the disturbing themes of their earlier works like My September and Suki Suki Daisuke with the singing and idol themes from Pink Bush Club. And to be honest, this series might have revitalised my interest in Vivinos as a channel. Anyway. Let's jump into the actual topic of this video. Alien Stage, one round, or round one. So, what is Alien Stage? The short answer is a uh, 
Sing Star Vivinos Tournament Arc, baby! Woo! The long answer, however, is still relatively simple and a lot less complicated overall when compared to other Vivinos works. A couple things of note about this specific Vivinos video before I begin the analysis. The video is one of few Vivino songs to be sung in Korean and not Japanese, like Gal or Tomoroid, Chino Squee, those are in Japanese, as was most, if not all, of Vivino's original and non-original music that were used in their videos. And on top of that, this is one of the few Vivino's videos that has English closed captions on YouTube, which makes my life so much easier. Anyway, let's discuss the video itself. Unsurprisingly, like most Vivino's videos, we follow the narrative of two girls. Shocking, I know. One with short black hair and purple eyes, and one with long pink hair, glasses, and greenish yellowish eyes, but their eye colour kind of changes throughout. The video itself isn't in chronological order, however, the video focuses on these two girls as they grow up in a post alien invasion world. For simplicity's sake, let's just give these characters names, as I usually do in these Vivino's explanation videos. As this character has SUA marked on their neck, we'll simply refer to her as such as either SUA or just Sua. I think I'll say SUA. We don't really get a good shot of this character's neck in the promotional material or in the video itself, so we don't know if there's a different marking, a same marking, or... We, do, we just don't know, so for now just let's creatively refer to her as Pink. Throughout the course of this video, we see the two children grow up in this world, dressed in all white during their childhood like lab rats, collars around their necks that change colours depending on the situation, their lives somewhat reflecting the children's lives in the Promised Neverlands, strangely enough, but replace the demons with aliens, but instead of them being raised to become mothers or food, they've been raised to become entertainers or pets, or maybe food. The similarity seems quite evident in my opinion, especially with the markings on their necks. Anyway, back to Alien Stage. The video starts off with SUA singing in some grassland when the two are in their younger years. Also, no, before anyone asks, no, I do not think this is the same field from the end of The Escape in a Dream. So please, no one ask in the comments because since I know that I thought it looked a little bit similar for a second, I, no, I know someone's going to try and make that connection and it's quite plainly not the case. Also, during this segment there is no music, only the atmospheric sounds of grass blowing in the wind, but as Pink decides to join in, the music begins to fade in slowly, and as the beat hits, we transition into the two of them on stage singing when they're a lot older. SUA dressed in white, and Pink dressed in black. That's a confusing sentence. <laughs> as the camera zooms out, we then see the two surrounded by lights. The two continue singing. Elated, as it seems she's passed some sort of exam. SUA seems to pass their test as well, and they both pug each other and it's all quite cute. We then cut back to the present with the two smiling at each other as they continue to sing on stage. We see them from afar as the camera tilts up, showing us that this is in fact some sort of versus battle. The photos of the two showing Pink smiling and SUA just kind of melancholically frowning. This is round one. I mean, Duh, look at the title. We then get a brief flashback showing us what Earth was like as it was being taken over. Whilst we see this, the narration comes in. The narration itself is most likely from Pink. She discusses how humans believed that anything that couldn't be solved by humans was the will of God. How we believe the entire universe revolves around Earth. How everything above the sky was where the gods lived. However, once humans left the universe and went past the sky, we forgot about God. In my opinion, this narration is just quite simply discussing our world now a little bit, as well as, you know, in-universe. 
the Mother World journeys out and expands our knowledge of the sciences and everything of the universe as we travel from Earth into space and into other universes, religion will become less and less common, as it already has in our own world. To be more on topic with the narration itself, it simply describes how humans have less need of faith when science and knowledge becomes more prevalent. However, if the one thing unique to humans is the ability to believe in something, then our character here will believe in a god. Her god. Her universe. SUA. Throughout this narration we get visuals of the world being destroyed as well as what the human race has been reduced to, seeing children wearing the same collars that Pink and SUA do, as well as a flashback of the two in a room with other children singing. This is more likely the exam that the two passed earlier, or maybe them going through some sort of alien idol training course, but given the way these aliens in the back are sat at a desk looking very judgy, I'd assume that they're judging the children's aptitude for singing, I guess, and whether or not they'll pass this test. The two then finish their song as their scores are charred behind them, the numbers rising and rising until they land on 87 and 86 respectively. We see the alien crowds chanting for them, only for blood to be smeared across Pink's face. Pink won. SUA lost. Whilst we don't see her corpse, we just kind of see a blood pattern along with what was left of SUA across Pink's face. Despite the fact that neither of the two were wearing their collars throughout their performance, I imagine if they go against the aliens, it would cause a similar effect of what happened to SUA. In my opinion, the collars are probably something like a weird combination between the Dead Man Wonderland collars and the explosive wristbands from JoJo's, but anyway. The video finishes with the alien crowd cheering over SUA's public execution after her loss, as Pink collapses to the ground, just breaking, another collar is placed on her neck by something that appears to be human, or at least humanoid, we can't really tell because of the distance and their face being obscured. As Pink collapses to the floor, the collar which is placed on her glows red as the title fades in. Alien stage. However, we get something else if we stay a little bit longer. We see that this is simply the first round of an elimination tournament containing six other competitors. Then the video is over. What was that about? Firstly, let's talk about the lyrics. There's a lot of references to flowers and blooming, etc. Stuff like that. And even in the chorus that's sung in English, we hear, Oh my clematis. Yeah, that word sounds awfully familiar and similar to another word, but hear me out. The clematis is a, a kind of a type of flower. It's the genus of a flower. To explain it in layman's terms, what a genus is, is you know how humans are homo sapiens? Well, our genus is homo and our species is sapien. But there was also homo neanderthalensis. There was also homo erectus. Basically, it just means that clementis is a family of flower, less so than a singular flower itself. So, <laughs> guess what? Even more flower symbolism in Vivino's videos that I'm not confident in. Yay. Overall, the lyrics in the song that's being sung, from what I can tell, are simply about finding hope in the abyss through love. How even if we're separated in the dark, I'll find your scent. You know, it's pretty much the type of lyrics you'd expect to hear about two people in a world where the only thing they have is each other, as the human race has been enslaved and turned into pets, entertainment, or more than likely food. However, again, there is something of note that isn't in the video itself. We know what most of the other contestants look like due to all the promotional material for Alien Stage, as well as the teaser that was released two days before the Alien Stage video round one. We also see some clips for our upcoming rounds of Alien Stage. We get to see little sneak peeks, but to be honest, the promotional material had me thinking that SUA was going to live due to the fact that the artwork for the video series that I saw the most was this. And this kind of paints SUA as the main character. I mean, she's even the thumbnail for the teaser, meaning that her death actually caught me a little off guard. In conclusion, we know for a fact that there is more Pink Bitch Club on the way. We just don't know when that will be. And to be honest, I am more than happy to wait if it means I get more of this bleak, drab and disturbing world as it kind of revitalised my interest in Vivinos. They finally went back to their roots somewhat by making stories that actually disturb you whilst also upping the animation quality significantly. Overall, what is the story of Alien Stage in a nutshell? It's another story about sad lesbians that die a lot. I mean, bro, what? Thanks very much for watching this video. I'm not gonna lie, I was a little nostalgic making this video because it made me realise that my first Vivinos video was over a year ago now. Editing Josh here. As I was editing the video, Q Meng herself commented on my last Vivinos video, which was about where Vivinos went. Uh, what the f off. And on another note, I noticed when I was editing the video 
that the markings on SUA's neck only really show up once she's older on stage and doesn't really show up before that point. I just thought I'd put this little bit in here because I kind of didn't know where to put it, but yeah, let me know your thoughts on that and uh, back to normal outro me. Alien Stage is the latest musical project from the Korean animation channel, Vivinos. I have discussed Vivinos at length in the past, as well as discussed the previous round, round 1, in another video, as well as the prologue teaser on stream, which you can click above in the top right to watch a playlist of now to get yourself up to speed. But right now, round 2, quite aptly enough, is the second round of this Battle Royale Sing Star Tournament. And to be honest, uh, apologies for being crass here, but this is it. Uh, this flipping slaps. Everything from the music to the smooth like butter animation. And at the same time, the video's narrative and plot retain some of the core themes and stylistic choices that Vivinos has become known for. Doomed and unrequited love, shocking and disturbing moments, as well as moments that just kind of make you pause the video and say, to that guitar of intestines. To be honest, this is one of the few Vivinos songs I would actively go out of my way to listen to. And the song here just goes hard. I'll cut you about how much I enjoyed the video later on, but for now let's dive into the narrative of this music video as well as some of the things you may have missed or may find interesting. So the video itself begins with Till, the protagonist of this round. If you couldn't tell, he's the one with the actual character design, not the NPC looking dude in the background. Anyway, it starts off with these two characters on the tournament round screen, which we've seen a couple times at this point, showing us that this is in fact round two. Shocker! <laughs> the two are then seen on an elevator that rises upwards, bringing them towards the stage for the next round. But there is something hidden in this shot. If you look closely, just look at the state of that guitar. Is that a hand grip on the side? It, it's the future and guitars are still using this many wires. We even see later in the video that the headstock of the guitar is floating and not connected to the rest of the guitar. Yet despite the fact that pieces are floating, this guitar needs this many wires. It, 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 it's a random design choice that blows my mind for no reason. Random tangent aside, the characters then proceed to go up and we get a shot of them from behind. We see the two and we see that they're pretty much wearing very similar clothes, white t-shirt and trousers. But despite that, they still look very different. As a result, we kind of know immediately which one of these characters isn't going to live throughout the rest of the music video. We also see what appears to be a chain or some sort of restraint around Till's neck, almost resembling a noose as they continue towards the stage. Once they reach the stage, a small beat starts in the background, but as Till raises his guitar pick and slams it down, he cuts through the silence. As the guitar strum echoes throughout the arena, we see how high the restraint around his neck goes. We also see the amount of flashing lights and eyes surrounding him, and we see the reaction of the other contestant next to him reacting to Till about to hit this fat guitar riff. Kick drums then come in as we see Till slowly walk forward. We see his guitar covered in wires and an eyeball. Ew. We see his face looking surprisingly calm, which is a bit of a juxtaposition with his emotions throughout the rest of the video. We see him in orange trousers and barefoot, resembling a prisoner quite a bit. Then he starts playing his guitar and as he begins, he also starts to sing with the line, we cut to see Till on stage from a distance, seeing him from the side. We can't even see the other contestant anymore, it's just him on stage, and it's pretty much going to remain that way for the rest of the video. As he starts playing, the title card comes in, Alien Stage. Till, maintaining his composure, continues to play whilst looking somewhat stoic and collected. Then he turns to his left and sees the pro tag from the previous round. And thanks for letting me know in the comments, but we now know that this character is called Mizi. M-I-Z-I, -I, I think? I've, I've, for the sake of argument, I'll call her Mizzy, just so it's easy for me to say. I've seen people call her different names, but as it says Mizzy on Vivinos' Twitter, I'll go with that one. Also, a quick note about the song itself once it starts. It feels a lot more punkish and rock. Given how Till is dressed, it makes a lot of sense, but to be honest, I wouldn't call it 100% full-on punk rock London's Calling by The Clash, at, at least in regards to the music itself. Whilst I know it's just a sheer complete tonal shift from all of Vivinos' other music, making use of guitars and drum kits and heavy use of kick drums from what I can tell, 
This is unlike most of Vivinosa's other stuff, which is usually much more synthetic sounding, which makes sense given what the PBC is. But overall, this song feels like a rock song with a little bit of punk in it and a little bit of metal later on, which is weird. I'll explain why. It's pretty nice. And out of Vivinosa's discography, I'd say that this is some of my favourite music, except Otomoroid. Otomoroid slaps. Otomoroid is the god. Oh yeah, alien stage. <laughs> Till sees a post round one Mizzy looking quite dejected for obvious reasons. We then flash back to why Till is seeing her in his mind whilst on stage right now. Why is he thinking about her? We flash back to him observing SUA and Mizzy together in their artificial landscape slash prison cell, having fun together. Then we see that Till himself is covered in injuries. As he can see them right now, it would make sense that Till himself snuck out to see them, as we don't see Till with anyone else. It's safe to assume that, for now, that he was left alone in his cell for most of the time. Unlike SUA and Mizzy, who had each other, Till was all on his own. The song continues, Till continues to play, until we get a shot of him bashing himself against a wall, bruises on his face and his collar glowing red like the pet human we saw in the previous round. The song continues and we see another flashback, Till hiding some flowers that we used to make a flower crown in SUA's and Mizzy's room. Till hides the flowers behind his back with handcuffed hands, whilst what must be Till's owner, I guess, in the doorway, which is then followed by a shot of Till covered in bruises and blood. We then get a glitch transition, which is followed by what appears to be Till writing songs and practicing in his cell. It appears that after he snuck out of his cell that the security around him has increased. As we see him in his cell, this is when Till's lyrics also start to come in more. I'll only talk about the lyrics that I feel have really large, significant narrative importance. For example, Nothing was my everything, the melody that filled the empty me. It's you alright. From this, I interpreted that Till was feeling quite hollow and lonely before he met Mizzy for obvious reasons, but once he heard her melody, it filled his emptiness. As we see in the flashback, when Till observes the two in their prison cell, he sees them singing and hears them. We then get a couple shots of Mizzy singing with a white background behind her. We then see the sheet music for the songs that Till was writing, which also contains some drawings of Mizzy adorning them. We then return to the present. I want to know all about you. This quite obviously signifies that despite all of them being child slaves, being forced into the same competition, most of the people participating in this tournament haven't really had too much interaction between each other, as well as the obvious romantic connotation of wanting to know more about someone you're interested in. We then get a nice little juxtaposition between the life of the two girls and Till. The two girls happily celebrating the passing of their exam, surrounded by light, dressed in white, happy and smiling. Meanwhile, the opposite is happening to Till. When we see him, the only light surrounding him is from the hologram in front of him. The word pass is the only light in the room, as he is also adorned in black clothes. But when he looks into the hologram, he sees a vision of Mizzy appear before him, whilst a very important lyric plays. The Edelweiss of my feelings that blossomed because of you. Now, this lyric can mean a lot of different things in different contexts, so I'm going to keep my interpretation of it relatively simple as to not overcomplicate it. The Edelweiss, I like pronouncing that is a fun word to say, is a flower. Great, more flower symbolism, which I absolutely love, but the Edelweiss, while having multiple meanings, usually has the connotation of purity and nobility, and on top of that, it's quite, a, it's somewhat of a rare flower, as it can only be grown in really high altitudes making, as some describe, a somewhat lonely flower that can only really grow in places like the Alps. Well, what does this mean in the context of Alien Stage? I mean, it must have been used for a reason, right? It could mean that Till's feelings of loneliness blossomed after searing and hearing Mizzy sing. I personally see the line as having meaning that Till's lonely existence had no feeling, but since he heard Mizzy and saw her, his feelings blossomed, she became his everything. I mean, in 99% of the shots of this video, if Till isn't playing some sick tunes on his guitar, he's fantasizing or doing something in relation to Mizzy. But that's my opinion on the line. There's also more in-depth interpretations you can look over with the specific history of that flower, but you can look that up yourself and feel free to let me know in the comments. However, this line is also followed by another interesting line. You'll never know. Which is some someone sung, sung in the background as an echo. Probably alluding to the fact that these two characters will never really have a direct interaction with each other that isn't on stage. They will never get the chance to probably meet if they haven't already. 
which is kind of a bit sad to be honest, I'm not gonna lie. But that's how I see these lines and how I interpret them. So please let me know your interpretation below. We then get yet another flashback to Till watching Mizzy on stage during the previous round in round one. It seems that the security around him has further increased as we see him with a gag in his mouth. Oh Vivi knows, <laughs> you and your yaoi. I don't think this time is enough. Yet again alluding to the fact that they don't have any time together. The closest to them being together is them passively watching each other on stage for a couple minutes at a time. Still, it's not enough for me, alright? Till, despite being forced to wear a collar, handcuffs, gag, still wants to spend more time with Mizzy. Still though, I think that it's quite intriguing that we don't really see Till's reaction to what happened to SUA on stage. Like, was he shocked and felt bad for Mizzy, or was he glad that there was less competition? Who knows? Lily, da, da, da. Why? Well, it's catchy. So the song continues bopping, Till keeps playing, but then the NPC character in the background realised that, you know, it's, this is an elimination tournament, so he better get some lines in before he just immediately loses. He needs to sing, but as soon as he is about to, Till smashes his guitar, causing it to explode with green goop and... Dorgan. Hello! I noticed that there's a minor graphical error here. Just above the unnamed contestant's head, you can see that there's a little shadow above him that kind of just cuts off for some reason. I noticed that. I mean, it's like, it's just like a little minor graphical thing. It's not, it's barely noticeable. To be honest, I don't know how I managed to pick it, but anyway, back to... Round two. Just before the guitar smash, which I will admit is pretty punk rock. The lyric, you're the one I'm feeling, it's love. That line seems pretty self-explanatory to me. What I love about it is what comes afterwards. When the opponent tries to sing, instead of Till's opponent's voice coming out, we get a guttural death growl from Till, which sounds like something straight from a death metal song. It's kind of quiet, but it's pretty sick. It's it's something like, it just sounds really cool. We then see Till smiling, covered in sweat, post guitar smash, looking quite proud in my opinion. We then see Mizzy raise her head slightly, reacting to what Till did. We see Till triumphantly turn to see Mizzy with her head raised watching him. Then we see that the aliens watching, I guess, don't really like rock music or smashing guitars despite how objectively cool both of those things are. And they kind of just go into a panic. Then we see that although they didn't seem to like it, as they have their fists raised in anger, pointing in confusion or just sweat profusely, Till still wins, meaning that the NPC looking dude just got murked off screen, <laughs> like goddamn. One little nitpick I have about this series so far, I wish it was more like uh, Danganronpa, okay, let me explain. In Danganronpa, every character, like even like non-important characters who will die immediately, they're all super over-designed, so you don't really know who's gonna die. And as a result, when you see any of the characters die, since they all look like main characters, it, it'll shock you immediately. No one started watching this music video and went, I hope, I, I think that really boring guy in the background, yeah, he, he's going to win, he's got this in the bag. The arena is just completely aghast, as if this performance was so fire it caused a public emergency. Then we see Q Meng and Vivinos' yaoi roots come in, as we see Till smiling as he's pinned to the ground by multiple men. So, we then get one final shot of Till passing out after being beaten, Mizzy beside him, and this character with the Sundarist Snaggletooth. I feel like I've seen this character's name somewhere on Twitter or something. Could someone please tell me in the comments what the character with the black hair is called? Or if we even know, because I'm not sure. We get one final graphic showing that this is the end of round two. And then we get the credits. My overall thoughts on this video are that narratively, everything we see solely in this video without further context provided from subsequent videos is relatively simple. Till has been literally raised in complete solitude from what we can tell, and as a result, after he had a small glance of Mizzy and heard her singing, he immediately became infatuated. And since that was his real outside contact that we know of with other humans, he just, he just became obsessed. He seemingly attempts to sneak out a couple times to see her, but as a result had more security placed on him, more so than other contestants. I mean, just look at the massive rope around his neck. The song itself reflects it through its lyrics, whilst the music itself is a weird rock song with a little bit of metal and a little bit of punk rock in it, which reinforces the narrative of trying to break free from the constraints placed on you by higher powers. I mean, in the world of music, you can't get more anti-establishment and more do-what-you-want attitude than punk rock. And if I was in this world, I feel like I'd be pretty punk rock too. I don't think I'd want to be a child slave either. Regarding the black-haired character, who I'll just refer to as Snaggletooth from now on, because I, I really don't know their name. Q 
Q-Meng made artwork of this character a little bit ago, and probably has a little bit of foreshadowing for the upcoming rounds. Who knows? I mean, a lot of the artwork shown off on Vivianos' Twitter shows something foreshadowing upcoming events. I mean, look at this piece showing off Till and Mizzy. This was released a good minute or two before the video actually came out, so keep an eye on their Twitter for more hints. Also, one more piece of art I want to mention from their Twitter is this. This character seems to act as somewhat of a teacher in the artwork, and we see her in the teaser and stuff. I have the feeling that she's somewhat of like a mother from the Promised Neverland. Maybe she was like in a previous tournament and survived. Now she has to train in the new competitors for the tournament. And my guess is that if she has a video of her own, it'll be about her feeling guilty or about that or something. I don't know. But there is one prediction I will make, which I promise you will come true. Till ain't gonna survive. <laughs> Probably, it's not gonna happen immediately, but... But this dude, despite making some of the some really really dope music and actually dressing pretty cool, 100% he ain't living till the end. <laughs> Please let me know your predictions and interpretations in the comments below. Please feel free to follow my socials, and I've literally just started a Patreon if you want to support the channel further. But now, time for the outro. So that was everything you need to know about Vivinos so far, as of the 27th of November, 2022. Yes, Alien Stage is only on round 2 and we have a few more rounds incoming, but I wanted to make a compilation of Vivinos' videos before Christmas so I could focus on other videos in the meantime, like finishing this horror anime and manga iceberg. Now that you've reached 3 hours deep into this video, like, wow, <laughs> Jesus Christ, I, I, I can't thank you enough. This channel's first major source of growth was originally started from me covering Vivinos, so it's good to see that people still want that content. So if you enjoyed, please like, comment and subscribe, but if you've sat through three hours of my waffling on, it's fair enough to say you like the sound of my voice. If that's the case, please take a look at my other videos. I have other videos covering monsters, vocaloid songs based on real monsters, and videos just on anime stuff in general. If you do so, it'd be very much appreciated. But with that being said, toodles my doodles, hopefully later in the next one. Peace, and uh, happy holidays. Now, I'm motivated. Ruby. Really?